Good afternoon and welcome to the September 2022 board meeting of the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, or the MHRA as we prefer to call it. My name is Stephen Lightfoot uh, and I'm the chair of the board and my role today is to lead us through today's agenda. However, before we do that, uh, and, and on behalf of the entire board, uh, I, I would like to record our sadness at the death of uh, Queen Elizabeth II and to express our condolences to the royal family for you know, what was a magnificent state funeral yesterday. I think as a public body as well, we, it's also important that we confirm our commitment to serve His Majesty's government, which obviously also includes a new Prime Minister and a new Secretary of State for Health and Social Care since the last time that we met. So it does feel like a new era uh, for the United Kingdom, but having said that, the MHRA will continue to use its scientific expertise and its independent judgment to protect and improve public health at all times. Now, for this meeting, uh, for those of you who've not attended before, I must start by saying that this is a board meeting held in public, and it is not a public meeting. It's also important to explain that the board is responsible for agreeing the strategic direction of the agency, maintaining high standards of corporate governance, and also scrutinizing the performance of the MHRA whilst making it also clear that this board is not responsible for making any regulatory decisions on individual products. And that's because the regulatory decisions are made on individual products by officials from the agency who themselves are independent civil servants making recommendations to ministers with the additional independent advice uh, from our expert advisory committees, such as the Commission on Human Medicines. Now, as far as today's meeting is concerned, and you'll also need to make you aware that we'll be recording the meeting uh, so we can publish the video on our websites to provide the opportunity for as many people to observe the meeting as possible. On that note, I'm also pleased to, uh, yeah, to report that 121 people, which I think is uh, near a new record, have registered to observe our meeting live today. And that's including 64 members of the public uh, or representatives of patient groups. It includes 31 people from industry, eight healthcare professionals, three government officials, three journalists and 12 members of staff. So welcome to you all and thank you for joining us this afternoon. So with introductions in mind, I'd just like to go around the room and ask each of my colleagues uh, here in the room today on the board to introduce themselves. So as I said already, uh, my name is Stephen Lightfoot and I'm the chair of the board. June. Good afternoon, I'm June Rain and I'm the CEO at the MHRA. Good afternoon, I'm Paul Goldsmith, non-executive director. Good afternoon, Claire Harrison, Chief Digital and Technology Officer. Good afternoon, Mercy Jersingham, Non-Executive Director. Good afternoon, Glenn Wells, Chief Partnerships Officer. Good afternoon, Raj Long, Non-Executive Director. Good afternoon, Mark Bailey, Chief Science and Innovation Officer. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Michael Whitehouse, I'm a Non-Executive Director. Good afternoon, I'm Rachel Bosworth, I'm Director of Communications and Engagement. Catherine Glover, Deputy Director, Medicines Regulation and Prescribing, Department of Health and Social Care. Good afternoon, Junaid Bajwa, Non-Exec Director. Good afternoon, John Taylor, Interim Chief Financial Officer. Good afternoon, Mandy Calvert, Non-Exec Director. Good afternoon, Alison Cave, Chief Safety Officer. Good afternoon, uh, Heather Zane, Non-Executive Director. Good afternoon, I'm Laura Squire, I'm the Chief Healthcare Quality and Access Officer. Uh, Graham Cook, Non-Executive Director. Good afternoon, Carly McGurry, Director of Governance. Great. Thank you, colleagues. Um, I'd also like to uh, just give a very special welcome to John Taylor uh, as our new uh, Interim Chief Finance Officer, because you've taken over from John Fundry and this is your first uh, board meeting uh, of, of the MHRA board in public. So uh, thank you for joining us, John, and for bringing your experience as well. I'd also like to take the opportunity just to congratulate Haider Hussein, who's been appointed by ministers as a full voting non-executive director for the next three years. So Haider, uh, congratulations. And also to Mercy Jessingham, uh, who's been reappointed for her second term, uh, all the way through to August 2026. So uh, thank you to both of you for agreeing to those extensions. I think we'll very much value your experience. I think on a sadder note, uh, I'd also like to recognize the death of Professor Dame Valerie Beryl um, on the 26th of August. Now, Val was a non-executive director uh, on this board when I first joined in 2015. 
and she was an internationally renowned cancer epidemiologist from Oxford. And she not only led the Million Women Study, uh, which has had a great impact, but was also a really, really strong advocate of CPRD. Now, I think it's possibly only June, Mandy, Michael, and myself that were the only board members present uh, who would actually remember Val when she was on the board. But I think it is still appropriate that as a board we recognise that. Uh, we just record in the minutes uh, you know, our sort of condolences to her family. Um, I think that would be very helpful indeed. So, uh, yeah, thanks to, to Val for great service to the agency over six years. So that brings us now on to uh, this particular meeting. And so uh, we've already circulated the board pack uh, of papers for today's meeting. And I'll use the page numbers in that board pack just to guide us through um, uh, the, the, the events of today. I'll also assume that everybody's read the papers so we can spend most of our time on discussion. And then finally, although this is not a public meeting, uh, we will provide the opportunity for members of the public to ask questions about the items on the agenda. And this can be done using the chat function on Zoom for anybody who's watching uh, you know, the meeting here today. Our Director of Communications, uh, Rachel Bosworth, will collate these questions and we'll answer as many of them as we can in the time we've got available. Now, if people raise questions that are not on the agenda, we'll commit to give a written response instead because we want to make the best use of the time that we have here today. So that's all I want to say by way of introduction, but can I just check with my learned colleagues whether there's anything else that I've forgotten? No. Okay, that being the case, let's uh, crack straight on with the, uh, with the agenda. So uh, the purpose of the meeting, I think, is, is quite clear. We've talked through uh, that already in terms of the way the meeting is going to be run. Uh, we've gone through the introductions. Uh, in terms of some apologies, we do have apologies from Greg Chalmers, the head of the Chief Medical Officer's Policy Division in the Scottish Government, from Alison Strath, the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer in Scotland, and also Cathy Harrison, the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer for Northern Ireland. In terms of declarations on page number three, can first of all I just check if there are any new declarations of interest that I should be aware of? Mandy. Uh, yes, I've recently... Uh incorporated a new company, it's not trading yet, called Phoenix Pharmaceuticals, which will be developing oncology drugs. Okay. So, Natalie, if we can just please make a note in the uh, minutes on, on that declaration. Were there any other new declarations I should be aware of? I'm not seeing any. Okay, so thank you for that. Just also, Natalie, just a point on the minutes. Now that Hayda's been promoted to non-executive director, can we amend the, uh, the declarations of interest form for the next time, please, as well? Uh, we can lose the associate title. Um, having looked at the agenda in some detail, I've reviewed the declarations of interest, and I don't believe that anybody is conflicted today, uh, so that we ask, need to ask them to leave the meeting for any of the particular items. So that was my view. Can I just check if the board is content with that as an approach? Yep, I'm seeing consent, so that will be excellent. If we then move on to the minutes of the last meeting, that's on page number seven. Um, first of all, can I just check if they're a correct record uh, of the last meeting from everybody's point of view? I'm seeing nods around the room. Yep, okay. So on that basis, please, Natalie, if we can just record those minutes as approved, as an accurate record of the last meeting. Um, on page number 12, we've then got the actions. Uh, just so quickly to go through the ones in red, which are the ones that are due today. Um, Action number 46 has been completed. Action number 51 is on the today's agenda, as is action number 52. Then we've got uh, actions 54, 61, and 84 have been completed, or that's our view. Can I just check that everybody's content with all the due actions being present today are appropriately managed? Again, seeing nods around the table. And can I just finally ask, are there any other matters arising that were not listed in the minutes or the actions that anybody wanted to raise from the last meeting? No. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So that takes us on to page number 15, and the first substantive paper is a report from our Chief Executive Officer on what are the most important activities and priorities from the CEO's point of view. June. Well, thank you, Stephen. I think it's clear from this quite detailed report that the summer's been a tremendously busy time for the agency, the months of July and August, with a number of important priorities that have been driven forward concurrently. So I'll try and keep my highlights quite brief to allow time for discussion. Uh, clearly, our focus on healthcare access 
remains a top priority, and the summer saw very intense work by our teams to deliver the two bivalent vaccines for coronavirus, the uh, Pfizer and Moderna, and those about now out there in the vaccine centres being delivered. So a very important uh, action by the teams involved to be very timely in a very thorough assessment uh, process. We've seen growing use of international collaboration in terms of particularly cancer drugs with the uh, FDA Orbis uh, initiative. And importantly for medical devices, we've seen a new UK approved body. And that's the first as a sovereign regulator and really worth demonstrating how focused we are on enabling access to some brilliant innovations in the medical devices space. Our scientific research and innovation work continues to be a key part of the enabling approach, further upstream really than the healthcare access work, but no less important. And a couple of examples there, the wastewater surveillance, together with colleagues at the UK Health Security Agency, has led directly to the public health response for vaccination against polio. And uh, we also authorised the clinical trial for the antiviral against monkeypox, again showing how important it is that uh, we're an enabling regulator. Research funded by the Coalition of Epidemic Preparedness and Innovations is also looking to deliver these reagents for antibodies for monkeypox, all really important work. Having said all that, patient safety remains our top priority, front of mind at all times, and the report's got some examples of work there, ranging uh, as diverse as the nebulizer for asthma, better advice that's been well received in the field, uh, across to pulling off the market, following a manufacturing defect, a medicine for cardiac arrhythmias, mexilatine. So supportive advice about switching patients if need be. And an exciting development with our new responsive um, reporting system, Safety Connect, which is rolling out in phased um, modules. So a big step forward there. All of this means that our organisation has to be very dynamically focused. Excellent work starting on a discovery programme for the regulatory management system. That will stand us in good stead as we optimise our services, which staff are variously engaged with right across the agency. I think it's important too that colleagues are aware of our work to address financial sustainability issues and the launch of our fees consultation, uh, first time in six years that we've actually looked again at what revenues we bring in and do they fulfil the requirements of managing public money. Our one agency live launch, which many colleagues participated in, really celebrated our outward face and it was great that many staff came along to hear from patient groups, uh, leaders in the life sciences and also in the public health world, the expectations of delivering our new work in the life cycle model. So really, Stephen, it's a story of quite a busy summer, I would say, but a very productive one and all of it depending on the staff who've really gone the extra mile to be sure that we can deliver high standards on time. Those are my words just to get things going. Great. Well, thank you very much, June. I think a very comprehensive report, as always, so thank you very much for that. Junaid, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, maybe, maybe to June and the executive. I mean, I, this is an extraordinary amount of activity. Polio, monkeypox, COVID continues, and all of this activity, I think, just to record my thanks, and I'm, I'm sure the thanks of the board to the entire staff of the MHR and everything that they've done. I think ordinarily any single one of these things would be a big deal, but collectively, I think it's an enormous deal. I, I, I presume also in terms of my question around this would be, have we learnt anything about the collaborations locally? So our work with HSA, the Health Protection Agency, <coughs> public, uh, public health bodies, or indeed the NHS, around how not only do we play our part, but the wider system also plays its part in trying to get um, the medicines to the public too. Have we learnt anything in, in the recent period around acceleration in that approach or anything that we would take moving forward? Okay. June? I think the big message that we've learnt is that we do everything better in partnership. Um, in other words, the synergies and the shared ideas and problem-solving approach always makes delivery more timely and uh, more robust. So, in a sense, everything we do is with others. I think that's a really important concept as we gear our services to the, to the future. Great. Okay. Colleagues, any other thoughts, questions? Mercy. Um, as usual, there's quite a lot of international work uh, going on June. So how do you think international work and cooperation is going and how do you think we should build on this? 
It's a work in progress. We've made an excellent start. The uh, consortium work with Australia, Canada, Singapore and Switzerland again is breaking new ground. We talked just now about the bivalent vaccines. Our reports were shared and if you've watched the international news, our approvals were all very closely aligned. So that kind of thing is, is taking off. But there's still more we can do, particularly as we've got ambitions in the areas of, for example, with medical technology, with establishing standards internationally. We're building the bridges, but we need to now then get into a delivery mode. So work in progress, but much, much more to be done, much more to be gained. OK. Michael. Um, June, thank you uh, for the very authoritative uh, paper that you produced there. Um, my question is really around um, public visibility and understanding of the role of the MHRA. So on the back of COVID, I think uh, public trust in the work that we were doing increased considerably. Um, there's reference in here to the um, yellow card scheme. And I was just wondering, how joined up are we with the rest of the NHS digital platform? So if I went into um, the NHS app, which I have got on my phone, would I find out about the yellow card there, or have we got more work to do in that space? We're getting there, and I'll turn to my colleague, uh, Claire, who's obviously Director of Digital and, and Technology to help, but the uh, app does link with yellow card, and yet there's much more we can do, particularly in the areas of surveillance, when we want to begin to strengthen that um, bridge that we have, that dialogue we have with reporters. Um, but there's wider issues than simply through an app to do with information exchange that makes, again, our partnership working much more powerful. And particularly, I'm thinking of our work with, with NICE, for example, but also with the NHS. It should be a truly seamless flow so that when we're looking at a risk that needs to be managed, our healthcare professionals and, and indeed patients can keep abreast of what we're doing because time is life, as we heard at R1 Agency Live. But that's just a starting point, Stephen, mm. for, for perhaps some more words. Maybe, Claire, do you want to add, add a little bit of colour from your perspective? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, June, you mentioned information exchange. So just on that point, um, we're looking at ways, not necessarily to integrate from an app-to-app -app perspective, but also exchange data as well. So there is a difference. Um, and a couple of members of my team have been conducting user research workshops as well on this to have a look at the whole health ecosystem um, and look at opportunities there. So the app, NHS app, app might be one, but there are, there are other things as well. When you think about all the different demographics and people who we would want to collect information and views from. Okay. Sourcing data is obviously one component. I'm just wondering, Alison, as, as Chief Safety Officer, you know, how important Yellow Card continues to be in terms of our safety vigilance uh, activities. Yeah, it's still in, it continues to be extremely important in identifying signals. Um, and of course, that needs to be complemented yeah. by as much as possible by, by additional information from other data sources. And we're continuing to work with NHS Digital to get that linked data sources to give us that more nuanced information, more comprehensive information around a particular signal that we might identify from our yellow card reporting. But I would just emphasize again how important that system remains to yeah. our vigilance in the UK. Great. Okay, well, thank, thank you for that. Excellent question, Michael. Uh, colleagues, any other points? I had one, if I may, actually, June, and, and you mentioned transformation uh, in, your, in your report. I just wondered, uh, you know, we've been talking about transformation now for you know, some months. I just wondered what stage you think we're at in terms of, uh, you know, completion. We've seen our transformation as four main areas, people, services, mm -hmm. technology, and our financial stability. Our one agency live launch, which was a really great mark of having got the people side, our one um, li product life cycle, one agency into being established. But there's a lot more to do to ensure that the services are opt optimal mm -hmm. and actually take advantage of the changing world around us. We know, for example, with our innovative licensing and access pathway, we didn't quite understand how important that was going to be as an activity for the organization. And we've had at least twice as many expressions of interest as than we would have expected. So a really lively time to actually gauge our services for the future. 
and then ensure that the technology that we have is state of the art. So putting a, what should I say, putting a time on it, I think we are mid-flight, mm -hmm. but, the, but the, the light at the end of the tunnel is definitely there, and I think we're beginning to see the, the, the true, if you like, full fruits of all the work putting the agency into that yeah. uh, product life cycle model. Okay. And it, and it strikes me certainly the, uh, you know, the organisational structure is one component, but there's, there's also continued investments in things like the regulatory management system. You know, and, and, and Laura, I was wondering if I could just bring you in in terms of the, the RMS, as we call it internally, the regulatory management system, is, is one of our key investments. Just wondered as the senior responsible officer, you know, how, if you could give us a sort of an update on where we are with, with that programme of work. Yes, I can. Um, uh, we are in the discovery phase for that, and that will go on until the end of October. So that's the first three months, which is really understanding through user research what uh, people's experience of using the current system is, what a system would help them to do differently, and really to start to, to understand what the scope of, the, um, of the, the, the minimal viable product, which we've said yeah. we will deliver next year is. We will deliver it on time, but there are questions around what, what is an MVP. Yeah. So the discovery period is really important for understanding yeah. that. Um, I have been really encouraged. I've actually sort of listened in on some of the user research interviews, and it is quite... Um, it's quite inspiring to listen how, how they get the right things out mm. of people. Um, but I think there are big opportunities, and I yeah. think that's really positive because when you're talking about increasing perfor performance, it is nice now to be finally able to talk to our staff about, and there is something coming along at all that will help you. Because there is a lot of work going on at improving process, but having a tool as well um, will really help and, and I think uh, it, so we're midway through discovery and there's some good stuff coming out now. Great well I'm delighted with that because I think certainly as we found with Safety Connect our other major investment program which is coming towards uh, its final implementation uh, you know this is actually the, another major investment on top of actually the, uh, the change in organizational structure so this is all about making the agency fit for the future uh, and capable of fulfilling its statutory responsibilities. Uh, Claire, do you want to add some more? Just a quick word on transformation, if you don't mind. Yeah. So we, we talk about it in terms of a programme, a start date and a stop-ish date. And I just think going forward, um, just around the principle of, uh, and I use it in my work a lot in digital data and technology, continuous improvement yeah. and continuous evolution and change. So that's how we're designing systems. So RMS is an example. And and making sure we have the capabilities to sustain that. But I just think taking that principle at yeah. a sort of higher and broader level um, is useful. I well. think you're so right, actually, because uh, I think all too often we've seen computer systems that get uh, new, new solutions introduced, and then they're not actually then further developed. And actually, the theme of continuous improvement, I think, uh, applies not just to systems, but to the way we operate generally as well. So that's a very p good point, well made. OK, colleagues, um, so are we happy unless there are any other questions, to accept June's report. OK, so thank you, June. Um, I think we should just record in the minutes again our, the board's thanks, uh, as, as Junaid quite rightly said, to not just yourself but the entire staff of the agency for all the incredible work that they do day in, day out. And so it's really very much appreciated. So thank you very much for that. In terms of uh, delivery, that takes us on to the next paper on the agenda, which is uh, on page number 23. And that's uh, our MHRA delivery plan, uh, which is really our strategic framework uh, for, we're now into the second year, the first quarter of the second year. Uh, John, I know you're new, but I know colleagues have helped you prepare a paper, so thank you very much for that. Um, would you like to just uh, give any introductory comments on how much of the MHRA delivery plan was delivered in the first quarter, uh, and are there any risks to its completion by the end of the year? John. Thank you. Um, as... Uh Stephen says I'm uh, relatively new, but have um, uh, reviewed with the help and prepared with the help of colleagues the paper. Um, introductory comments really would be that uh, the, the EXCO uh, has fully reviewed this. Uh, conclusion is that we are in a good position overall. Um, there are some notable items completed this quarter, and that is shown in one of the tables in the paper. Um, there are uh, handling plans in place for any off-track items um, and that has also been scrutinised pretty carefully by the Delivery and Performance Committee and the EXCO and agreed mitigations are well underway. Um, almost everything within the plan 
uh, remains and is expected to be due within the plan's lifetime, with a number of exceptions which are shown in the report, where elements of work will roll over into future years, and primarily this is just to do, tight, to do with timing. Um, it is worth noting, talking about risk, um, the only real risk is it's worth noting that Q4, just to do with timing, is pretty well loaded and will be very busy. Um, uh, also worth noting that we've been developing this approach um, alongside the balanced scorecard uh, materials, and they are complementary, and we will aim uh, and, and hopefully achieve them being well and synergistic mm -hmm. together in the future, so they operate together. Um, also wor worth noting that this report covers Q1. Th there is a time lag, uh, obviously. Um, some of the items that are, for example, noted as either amber or red in this report, actually, when you see the Q2 report, will actually show up as green or amber, etc. So, um, also at the end of the report, there is a table uh, showing that Exco have amended certain deliverables um, and that amended plan and the consequent RAG analysis will be uh, reported in the Q2 report. Um, I think it's fair to say, in summary, it, it, we're in decent shape. I think it's also fair to say that it is a work in progress yeah. and it will continue to be progressed through Q2, 3 and 4. Great. Well, thank you, John. And, and actually, I, I just applaud the team, actually, in terms of the transparency. Um, you know, I think this is a very clear format. It's very easy to read and it's very clear to un understand where some of the stresses and the strains are in the area of delivery. So I think uh, particularly thanks to your team uh, for, for doing that. Um, colleagues, uh, any particular questions or concerns that anybody would like to raise? Yeah, Mandy. Yeah, no, th thanks, John. I was just looking at the uh, loading in quarter four and when will we be able to assess whether quarter four is going to be deliverable or not? Because I'm just thinking there are some things we're identifying now mm. which seem unlikely and do we need to, how can we be proactive so that quarter four doesn't catch up with us too quickly? Uh, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> it would be obvious for me to say we'll know at the end of Q3, uh, but uh, to be honest, it's being pretty much uh, measured and assessed, n not on a day-to-day -day basis, but on a regular basis. We will have a greater visibility of that in the Q2 report. Um, but it, it's a very fair point. We just need to be vigilant and deliver what we say we are going to deliver in Q4. There is a risk that something will slip. Uh, I think if it does slip, it will be a timing slip rather than an achievability slip. And that is, like, if anything, if there is any slips, that's likely to be resource-related. But at this stage, that's not expected. I think that's quite important, actually, a point that you've just made there, uh, John, in terms of uh, it might be timing if there is any risk. It's not to the achievability of the objectives that we've set ourselves. So that, I think, is really worth just making a note of in, in, in the minutes. Uh, Michael, I know you want to come in, but Graham, can I come to you first? Yeah, I mean, first of all, to echo that I think it, it overall looks like a fantastic um, package of work. Just to pick up on a couple of things related to trials, mm. um, I suppose it's worth noting that one of them that's moved to Amber seems to be almost a success in that the consultation was, was very successful and that's delayed some of the implementation. But I just wanted to ask you a bit about the enhanced clinical trials because I couldn't understand the mitigation for that and, and what is the plan in terms of securing funding? John, is that something you'd like to pass on to Mark by any chance? <laughs> you spotted me looking at him, yes, please. Mark, <laughs> would you like to uh, help, please, with that one? Um, certainly, sorry, which one are you... So there's a deliverable um, that's moved to red, which is around enhanced clinical trial service. Uh, and my understanding is that there isn't funding secured for that. If I'm ah, yes, it. this reflects an IT situation. Um, we have um, basically a shared system with HRA, which is responsible for our joint um, clinical, uh, clinical trials. That system was fine, but unfortunately the HRA decided to upgrade their IT system leaving the interface slightly hanging. This was an unexpected development of a couple months ago, and we're trying to secure funding so that we can mesh the two IT systems again. We have a workaround. Unfortunately, it's the more traditional way of passing data between us, so we prefer an automated system for the efficiency, but we're definitely going to find some way of bringing those two systems back together. So, so you're, you're confident you can find the money for that? 
Um, we're going to um, have to keep asking, but uh, uh, at this point it's not budgeted, but we are going to try and find a way forward because it has a huge knock-on effect on the clinical trials. Can I just ask who are you asking? Well, within this would come as requests to Claire Harrison's team and also raised at Exco, but it, it is something which could be of sufficient see, um, seriousness that we take to DHSC. Yeah, and what about uh, health research authorities, uh, you know, contribution to this? Is it's obviously their uh, computer system that's actually led to this? Um, it's, we've not had those discussions as yet. Hmm. Okay, so I, th I think it's part of a partnership arrangement here. I think we need to be looking at all sources, but clearly I think uh, continue to progress that through the governance processes. Because, yeah, to be fair, your, your, con your, your answer was not the most assuring. No, it is a developing situation, Stephen. Yeah, okay. Great. Okay. Michael, and then I'll come to Hayden. Um, yeah, it, it's, if, if you look at the plan, um, you originally intended to, if I read this correctly, by the end of quarter four of this financial year, that's the end of April, uh, March 23, to deliver a 15% uh, reduction in corporate costs. That's now shifted by 12 months to the end of uh, March 24. Um, I don't think that gives me that great deal of confidence, you know, a, a, a delay of 12 months. Um, I, I suppose, John, and I, I know you've only recently arrived, but I put this to the whole of the executive. Are you confident that you've got a realistic programme to deliver those savings? Because 12 months is a considerable length of time, particularly when the debate going on about the UK's public finances, about we are been encouraged to deliver greater efficiencies and improvements in productivities. I, I find that figure, that delay, disappointing. John? Uh, simple answer is it's always going to be a constant task, if that makes any sense. Um, th th there, there are deliverable savings, um, whether it's an overall 15% or it's, it's not a quit. Sorry, let me rephrase that. We are confident of getting to where we think we need to get to, potentially a shifting of how we get there, if that makes any sense, and that is a constant work in progress. But I mean, I'll defer to the rest of the exec colleagues to contribute. They've got far better sort of in-depth knowledge than I do. But um, from the time I've had here already, I am reasonably confident that that can be delivered, yes. Okay. Yeah. June, is there anything else you want to add there in terms of, because obviously, we'll looking at the corporate costs has been something we've been talking about for yep. many years. Uh, I know, John, you haven't been here, but, uh, but this has actually been an ongoing discussion for some time. Well, there are a number of elements to this plan, and I think it's helpful to get the feedback today that we should look again at these to see if we can mm. um, get more value from some of the elements. For example, that we've made major gains, major yep. savings, I should say, out of the accommodation side. But let's um, take this on board and look again. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd, I'd also encourage you to look at some of the things that might actually facilitate that. Um, so, so actually, is that, is that more investment in technology? Is it sort of a, a different footprint we need? Are there some different skills that we need? You know, I, I, I think rather than just allowing it to slip, I think I'd encourage you to be thinking, what do we need to do to achieve this objective? You know, and, and almost think the impossible, as it were. So I think that's probably, John, I think, uh, you know, with your new hat on, you've got the, the benefit of fresh eyes to sort of look at that coldly, I think, and objectively. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions on the delivery plan? Yeah. Raj. <coughs> Thank you. Um, John, I agree. This is, this is really nicely laid out in terms of being able to um, understand quite easily as to what the, where the issues are. Just thinking out loud on the clinical trials piece, should we, is there a potential for a lesson there for us to learn to say who are our key partners where we interface quite a lot and have a formal arrangement that when they are going to upgrade the IT system, they have a discussion and work with our IT system so that we, uh, I'm not saying reacting to this, but at least be able to, to manage it mm. a little bit more. Just a thought there in terms of, um, and, and put a plan around it so that it perhaps come to the board. Yeah. yeah. Mark, do you want to respond to that quickly? They did give us um, fair notice with what we are, we're trying to arra arrange here. The trouble is it came outside of the budgeting year. So, therefore, it's kind of understand the scope of the problem and yeah. then set up a mitigation plan. 
um, whether we can, to what extent um, we, we learn from it. Yes, we have the communication, possibly even more advanced notice would have helped, but um, they have to bear in mind that within each organization, they have their own planning cycles yeah. and they don't necessarily pick up all the external contingencies. Yeah. So. Yeah, and it's a lesson for us as well, mm. uh, you know, in, in our other external partnerships too, I would suggest. Um, you know, but I think the good thing is at least we have a very good working relationship with the Health Research Authority. So I think that uh, all the components are there, but I think we do need to make sure that we can actually ensure we have an automated solution, because otherwise a lot of manual workarounds are not efficient. Uh, and my worry is the service we can continue to offer industry uh, and, and developers. That, that feels quite important. Um, Heda, I know you had a question, then I'll come to Junaid. You. Sorry about the mic. Um, great to see the legacy systems being mapped to future projects. Um, but I note that uh, budget is still to be secured for quite a few. I think we've just been hearing about some of the risks that, um, you know, to, to future savings and things like that. But I'd just, just like to get your feel for if we can't secure budget for some of these projects, um, are we mapping, are we using existing budget or do you see this as, as, a, as quite a big risk that we need to mitigate? It's a couple of things. So we're just going through a period now where we're looking at savings and efficiencies and what we might have to uh, and how we might reprioritise. But also um, just with scope of some of the other projects and work streams, um, there's a couple of similarities or synergies across across this. And and now that we're more um, now we've made more progress with delivery on some of those things. Again, we can just take a step back and look at the scope and if that needs to change a bit without anything moving to the right. Um, so there's quite a few things happening in the background. Number one, um, looking at um, savings and efficiencies and how we might repurpose some budget. Number two, again, just refining and continuously improving scope and what we're delivering as well without. Um, scope creep, if that makes sense, and just being leaner in, in prioritisation. So if we have to deliver 20 things instead of 50, but doing them really well, then that's what we will do. So those conversations are ongoing, so John will know and Mark and, and quite a few others here as well. Yeah, I think that's very helpful, actually, Claire, because um, the, the reality is we're now working in a different accounting environment to how the way we have in the past. We're no longer a trading fund, which means we have no reserves. So we've got to live within our means on an annual basis. And I think, actually, that ongoing uh, review of what progress are we making, you know, we can maybe make savings on one program to actually invest in another. So I don't think there's always binary choices here, is, is, is my view. And we've got to actually make sure that we can move the most important projects, like Safety Connect and Regulatory Management System, absolutely forward, but then work the rest of the budget so that, one, we do spend it all in the year, but also we get the best uh, bang for the buck in terms of the impact. But yeah. Claire, you want to come back? Yeah, I uh, don't think I'll have any problems spending what I need to spend in the year, so rest assured. But just a lessons learned, and I know it's easy to say that, but when I've heard about the HRA situation and so on, it's all around getting that balance right about being able to communicate, if you like, with other systems, but not making sure, but making sure that they're not so tightly coupled yeah. that we're in a situation like this. And again, newer technology and better. IT paradigms and design principles um, will help with that. Yeah. Um, so that's looking forward, but learning mm. from lessons as well. Yeah, and that's important because we're going to have more and more of these partnerships as we expand our international partnerships. We, uh, you know, we're working more closely with other, uh, you know, other health bodies within the health ecosystem in the UK. This is going to become more and more our way of operating. So it becomes quite an important learning point. So I think it's beyond just HRA and becomes a more, a more general principle, as you rightly say. Junaid, I think you had a question. Uh, yes. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Stephen. So my question refers uh, to the deliver transformation piece, and I think it's probably one for wider executives, so, so not one for you in isolation, John, on this one. But the comment there around capacity and capability constraints, and we've seen even from June's report, the demand is unrelenting. So the demand coming into the agency is completely unrelenting, and I think this probably my question links into the, the next agenda item, but I just wonder, are we doing enough to support colleagues to prioritize 
to think about what absolutely needs to get done in Q3 and Q4, whilst recognizing that we may not have the capacity on the ground, and we're moving into a challenging winter where cost of living and other issues will emerge as well as top of mind for, for many of the staff in the agency too. And I, if I think about the delivery of transformation, it's all about our people. And I just wonder if there's more we need to do to support the executive and indeed our people to think through how we can optimize the transformation agenda ahead of us. That's a really broad question. So, <laughs> co colleagues, probably unfair to ask John on this one, to be honest, but, uh, and I'd rather not ask uh, June as well, actually, just uh, we'll give June the last word on this. Are we supporting our people and to help prioritise? Um, Glenn, maybe it could bring you in. Uh, you know, what more could we do in that area? Uh, I think we actually are <coughs> coming up very soon working with the One Agency Leadership Group on, on this topic to see where, um, as services develop, as the transformation structure embeds, yeah. what does that look like for us and how can we start to rationalise what we do? Mm. So I'm quite I'm personally optimistic that we are in the right place because the machine is moving the way it should move yep. and we can have those conversations about prioritisation. Okay. Uh, Laura, how about in your, in your area? Um, I think it's you just press the button, please. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think the One Agency Leadership Group is getting into the right place. I think the other thing is about understanding um, the, the performance that we yeah. have now and the management information, and that does link to the balanced scorecard and some yeah. of the things that will come up later in those discussions. I think if we can, we are doing some exercises now with um, activity recording to understand yeah. how much time people are spending on things. And I'm expecting things to come out of that um, of non-productive time that people are mm. spending on meetings, um, other things uh, that they shouldn't be doing. And once, we, once we've got the information, we can have the conversations about, well, you could actually stop that. I think what's very difficult, other than at a very high level, is to set priorities down, top down. It needs to be a co also a conversation of, I have this much space in my week and this much stuff to do. Out of these, which ones can I yeah. drop? And so there is a sort of a general steer and then a specific. Yeah. So it's top, a top up, top down and bottom up. And I think we, some of the stuff we're doing on activity recording and the conversations we're starting to have is going to be helpful. I think in my area in particular, we, we have um, appointed, finally appointed and sorting out some, one, one layer of management which has taken co quite a long time to get there and I think that's really helpful as well mm. because people knowing exactly um, who, who they can go to and who they can talk to and then we can start to talk about accountabilities and targets and things and I think that will help as well. Yeah. So I don't think we are there yet with prioritisation but I think we're going in the right yeah. direction. I like the idea of the top down and the bottom up because you need both. You do. Uh, you, you know, I don't think we can just leave it and, and abdicate to our staff. Similarly, yeah. we can't uh, do everything top down either. So I think that's very, very helpful. Mark, I'm just thinking from a scientific point of view. You know, we've got uh, staff at South Mims. You know, how, how are we helping to prioritize them to prioritize their time? Very much what Laura's saying. We've um, actually started a top down and bottom up move within uh, SRI. It's not just South Mims. So um, there's a lot of external um, pressures on there, but um, we're focusing very much on where the public health emergencies mm -hmm. are. So we've prioritized the work on monkeypox. Yep. Um, that means that we inevitably slow down some of the less important stuff, which is work across SRI saying which standards can we actually maintain from the stocks longer, mm -hmm. how do we balance it. So it's a continuous dialogue. Stephen, it is in response to external, but um, it involves the individual groups prioritising, bringing into the management team and us setting the right balance at the end of the day. Yeah. So, Janae, there's a, there's a number of comments there. Just thinking of your experience, uh, you know, outside of uh, the MHRA. Uh, any other thoughts that you've got? I think it's continual dialogue and we have to be really adaptive in the current circumstances. I think external factors are so critical for us not just around what we can control, but even thinking about having true empathy as to what it means to be some of our, our staff on the ground and thinking about what's important to them having come out of the, the, the brief exodus of the pandemic that we are today, but who knows what the winter will hold for us moving forward. Uh, but just continuing to be empathic around their needs, I think is something that we need to hold true to. Great, okay. Uh, June, any final comments from you? I think the common themes coming out as we hear, we're all thinking about bottom up, top down. I think it will not just be focusing relentlessly on priorities and taking account of the external pressures and developments so that staff 
know that they're supported at this very important time, but it's a change in leadership focus. I think transformation is the word of last year. As we look forward into this era, it's delivery mm. and to do that in a prioritised way. And so the leadership in this area um, is something I've been very much focused on to make an appointment to deliver that prioritisation with everyone exco behind, yeah. behind it. Okay, great. Thank you, colleagues. Any final thoughts or questions on the delivery plan paper? Okay. Well, thank you, John, and thank you to the team, as I said, for putting together a very clear paper. Um, we're asked to note this report, uh, and I think we can gain a lot of assurance from what we've actually seen. Uh, you know, remain hopeful of uh, clearly achieving all of the objectives by the year end. That is not been written off uh, as, a, as a possibility yet. Uh, but it's obviously important that that constant improvement, that continuous sort of uh, prioritization, uh, and that top-up, bottom-down uh, approach feels uh, the right way to go. So if we can uh, note the report with thanks, that would be excellent. So that takes us on to the next paper on page number 33, uh, which is around the operational performance of the MHRA. John, I know this has got your name on it again, but I think in reality um, we can recognise this is a piece of work in progress as we're trying to work through uh, how we actually sort of measure and manage performance across each of our operating units. Um, so, again, you can assume that we've, uh, we've read the report, John, but are there any other introductory comments you want to make or do you want to pass on to your colleagues? I'll, I'll, it would be easy just to pass it on to my colleagues, which, which I will do, but the only comment I would make is uh, the, the, the once it, basically this is a performance report, obviously, a quarterly performance report. Well, once we have all hard agreed, if that makes any sense, on the metrics, um, I think it is quite important that we, along with the delivery plan, to be fair, and linked to the delivery plan, we, we set ourselves targets. Hmm. Um, uh, so that we know what good looks like, we know what expectation is, we can measure ourselves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, certainly, the only introduction I would also give is in terms of the finance section of this, which is in very early stages. The, the, I mean, there's five numbers in there. Uh, I think when it comes to the quarter two report, there will be a lot more numbers. Um, <laughs> some of you may like that, some of you may hate it, um, but it will look more like a, probably in the finance section. We'll try and look more like a traditional set of accounts of. Uh, and try and give as much granularity around performance in certain areas rather than just global numbers for the whole agency. Yeah, I, th I think there's a limited benefit we can gain from uh, just a, Completely a, a, agree. To a top line expenditure or uh, in in income perspective. Completely agree. Um, okay, um, so I'm just thinking of the best way to try and do this. Can I, maybe we just go through section by section rather than just randomly go from uh, uh, all, all over the place. So can I just ask, ask colleagues if there's any particular questions around the finance section first? Michael, as expected. <laughs> Sorry, inevitably. Um, given some of the difficulties we encountered with the um, financial accounts, which we got through, are you happy around uh, our control over debt recovery now? Um, good question. Uh, simple answer is yes. Um, the main issue we had over debt recovery was process. Um, I am... Um, I am more comfortable. Uh, am I relaxed, stroke, very comfortable? No, I, I think there is still work to be done around process. Some of that um, uh, is relying, if you like, on some of the RMS work that's being done in terms of the data from the, uh, from the business. But generally speaking, yes, I am more comfortable. I think we will, it will, the, the issues that were seen at year end will not be replicated this year. Okay, thank you for that assurance, John. Thank, thank you. you. Can, can I just actually dig into that a little further, John? You know, what gives you the, uh, the, the confidence that it's moving in the right direction? Because we're talking of £13 million worth of outstanding debt here. That sounds like a large number to me. Um, good question. Um, a, a lot of it is to do with people. The, 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 there are different people. A lot of it is to do with, I know it's going to sound, it's, it's not a comfort, but you know, it's almost a case of you make, you make the, you know, now that it's a known issue and... Yeah then people are more aware. Um, there are process improvements. There have been uh, changes made to how we do, how we do things. Things are checked. Um, and it, it is just, uh, why am I, because we are monitoring it. It's actually quite a high level of debt at that particular time in the year. Yes, this debt is high, 
but a lot of that is to do with timing and a lot of that is to do with some revenue recognition going forward. Yeah. So the debt is there, but some of it actually, that, that's when the debt was recorded, it isn't necessarily due, if that makes any sense. And we it need does. to start reporting it differently. Yeah, I th Instead I th of reporting what the debt is, yeah. we now need to also start giving more granularity around when it is due uh, and how that relates to, I mean, that's just a, a, a blob debt. It doesn't say how many days are outstanding, it doesn't relate Quite. to the revenue to what it relates. Etc. So it overdue is, it debt is exactly what you need to be looking correct. at. Correct. Absolutely. So I think okay. Well, Absolutely. that gives me more confidence actually that you, you're gripping the issue. Yeah. Um, okay. The, the next section was on people. Um, any particular questions around that, uh, Graham? Um, well, and I'd note also that this was going to be updated after a meeting on the 30th, so it'd be helpful to know if there is any update. Uh, I suppose my main thought was that a lot of the conversations we're having and a hearing are about filling vacancies and what that means for performance uh, and I'm not sure I got a sense from what was here about how how the vacancies were relating to performance so if there had been any change sort of updated thinking on what might be reported to the board that would be helpful okay June could I maybe come to you on that um, rather than go around it's a key each. point for the agency at this moment <clears throat> given that you know performance is directly related in, in some areas in particular to the level of um, staffing. Where there are vacancies, the performance will drop. Um, we're pushing us ahead as hard as we can with appropriate support, including headhunters for key specialist posts. And I think you know, delivering our new services is absolutely linked with those senior level positions. Um, I think for the next iteration of this, we'll need some more granular detail here for you to see. <clears throat> yeah, because I, th I, th I think actually it'll, it'll differ in, mm. in different areas so I think getting a sense of where the real stress points are I yeah. think you can then make the uh, ap appropriate linkage with, uh, with the performance in the, in, the, in the later pages I think then Graham so that feels that you know we're looking at our people data more at a more granular level in the same way we look at the financial data I think will be more insightful um, okay any other thoughts Mercy um, this might relate to your comment about granular granularity um, Around the culture um, and the the turning the corner, I just wanted to get kind of chief officers kind of feedback on if they why they think we've turned a corner because obviously it's it's early days as they yeah. say. Um, and the the other one on um, the diversity um, issue really, why those particular figures. Um, so, yeah, was there consideration of other EDI kind of figures, really? Okay. Um, yeah, so just on those two, well, I think. Well, may maybe, Al Alison, could I maybe come to you first and just sort of say, just from a cultural point of view, um, do you think we're, you know, in, in your experience, in your part of the, uh, the agency, that we are turning a corner? For me personally, in my group, uh, very much so. I think that we are... We've been working hard at integrating different areas of expertise into common therapeutic groups, and it's really rewarding and encouraging to see how staff are really yeah. truly working together and sort of people who were you previously did medicines and now are doing yeah. devices issues, and people who did devices are doing medicines issues. And the, the, the beauty of that is it builds resilience in our team, so we're less dependent on a single individual. We have a group of people who understand different aspects of our business which which then builds strength in depth I think the other thing that's really encouraging is safety connect mm. coming through and this you know to build on some of the issues earlier about resource this is technology which will really yeah. help um, managing our signals we're building in new technology new functionality new reporting requirement with new reporting enhancements for patients so that we can ask questions automatically without having to do around when we see a particular issue come through so i think all of those will help our staff and particularly in the devices area safety connect will bring really you know mm -hmm. step change in functionality about how to integrate and how to analyze devices so I think those sort of things is encouraging and I'm hoping that as staff start to see those enhancements and improvements come through and and work together on different areas which in itself is really interesting yeah. that will that will help in terms of the overall culture and motivation and sense 
of the teams. I think that just goes to show how interrelated all these different components are in reality. It's not just about the money. It's not just about the people. It's not just about the technology. It's actually all of them. And also then process on top of that and then priorities on top of that. So there's a number of things here all sort of coming together. So uh, I think that, that's a very helpful uh, and in insightful suggestion. On the diversity question, Mercy, was there a more specific question that you were wanting to, to ask there? Not really. I mean, it's, it's really about why, why um, be a AME and disabled staff. I mean, why, why pick those two? I know, I know in, the, um, in the scorecard we just had to, yeah. you know, obviously pick something. Um, but I, I'm, as, as always, every time we pick something, it's always mm. about, well, why didn't we pick those? Mm other issues um, up um, and as long as there's reassurance they're kind of being monitored and yeah. you know things being done and and maybe um, yeah so so it's just a general question mm. really about why those two particular yeah. things so Ju June is there a particular thought on, on why those two were chosen do you know I, I do know that there are a lot of other data mm. on protected characteristics the work of the networks um, you know, the strategic approaches that we're looking at in line with what DHSC is doing. And uh, I can't give you why those two mm. were chosen, but we, we certainly can find that out. Mm. Because I think, because it's such a live area for us, we should be really much more perhaps intelligent about what we choose as, yeah. a, as a key exemplar. Um, let's work on it more, and maybe even in, um, well, perhaps your committee can give us a bit of mm. insights. Yeah, you see, I, I think actually it, it's about time we actually had another equality, diversity and inclusion report to the board actually to, to probably to look at it in more detail as a, as a deep dive because I think actually there's always going to be a limit to what we can get from a few s small statistics. Yeah, for, for, for what it's worth, you know, my, my question on a similar issue, Mercy, was you know, why grade seven and above? Because actually I would have thought diversity at senior civil service level uh, SCS 1 and 2 feels to me far more important because actually I think we've got a very diverse organisation, less so at the top of the organisation. But uh, Claire, did you want to add something to that? Yes, I'm not sure how popular this will make me, but one step at a time, when I look at diversity, I also think about non-protected characteristics. Mm. So there is a level enough agenda yep. still, I think. And so maybe that's something that we need to think about as well how we contribute to that when you think yeah. about what we represent and, and the population and diversity yeah. and so on there but one step at a time so yeah but, but looking through all the lenses i think is the point you're making mm -hmm. so uh, you know, i think mercy you'd agree with that uh, I, 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 I would expect too so uh, okay so so i think i, I think maybe a, on, the, on EDI in particular, it's probably worth having a specific report to the board uh, on, on that. And I think we're overdue that anyway. So we need to look at our board schedule for that, I think. Uh, Hayda, and I'll come to Mercy. Uh, Amandi. Just quickly on culture, it's really, really great to see that Bill um, Walker was in thought in family decision making, hedging back up. I was just wondering if there's any other indication of what the Q2 score was. Oh, sorry. Do you want me to repeat that? Yes, please. <laughs> Apologies. Um, for um, culture, it's really, really great to see the schools for walking the walk, uh, walking the talk and timely decision making going back up, um, edging back up, it's still very, very low. I was just wondering if um, we had any early indication of a Q2 school, because I think the pulse surveys have gone out. And I don't think we, don't think we know. Okay. okay, I don't think we do, I think is the answer to that one, uh, you know, Hayda, but I, th I think we need to be careful that we don't start declaring victory. 10% uh, mm. walking the talk is still very low, let's be really frank about that. So I think there's, there's more work to be done regardless, I think. Yeah, we'll cling on to anything, I think, in that <laughs> sense, but yeah. Uh, Mandy. Uh, thanks, Stephen. There's a, there's a couple of points. One perhaps a little bit more generally on the, uh, that goes across people and other sections, is that if we can use this balanced scorecard to, to both put the numbers and metrics in context in terms of the board, what the board can do. Yeah. So it's at that board level discussion rather than Exco. So I think that would be really helpful and for chief officers to maybe highlight areas of difficulty where we might need greater influencing or whatever. So that was a sort of comment. A, a, a general comment. General. Yeah, I think that's probably a helpful one. And then a little bit more specifically on, on people. Um, 
I saw our numbers are still low, sort of 200 below our budget, which is good financially, maybe less good from a performance point of view. But we have struggled for probably six months to get the re to get recruitment and people in place. This doesn't really give me any context for understanding exactly where the difficulty is still. So uh, we've, we've got 78, 74 voluntary leavers. What, is that something I should be worried about? That people have got into jobs and they're just leaving because they don't like working at the agency or the terms and conditions aren't right? Or is that expected? So I, if you could put that into context, I don't know who, who okay. would be best to answer that. Are we getting people into roles and are we keeping them in roles? And what are, th what are the main issues that are stopping us recruiting yeah. into roles? Maybe June, can I just come to you in terms of uh, that, that just as a starting point, please? Well, I think we do need the breakdown, otherwise it gets anecdotal. Um, we do know that quite a number of colleagues, if you like, went longer than they would have done postponing retirements, etc., because of COVID. But there could be others, it's churn at what level and at what degree of retention. And we also have to be quite realistic about, you know, the career potential in certain jobs is going to be two or three years, and then people will look to move, and it's our duty to ensure that career progression opportunities are there. One of the great things that we're beginning to see, and as Alison has talked about, is that people are suddenly deciding, yeah, I did devices but I can do medicines mm. and that's a really rewarding and fulfilling aspect but we want to see more of that particularly in the areas that Mark oversees but I'd rather get some facts here otherwise it yeah. will be anecdote yeah, yeah. Okay, so voluntary leavers I thought I interpret that as leaving the organization maybe I've misinterpreted that yes that's what it means Right mm. yeah. Alison, did you want to add some colour to that? Yeah, I was just also adding colour that in, in, in safety and surveillance, we've had quite a lot of successful internal promotions. So that means we recruit, we advertise a job externally, um, we get an internal promotion, which is excellent, but that then leaves another gap within our organisation that they've filled. Mm. So we've then got to recruit into that gap. So while we've had a successful round we still have a gap in the organization so that's happened quite a lot in my yeah. particular group i think this may be a classic example where we probably do need more data before we can probably dig into this in too much detail but i think i think mandy makes a good point in terms of trying to get data that the board can interpret it, it's not just about the numbers it's about you know i think the comment was made earlier should we be worried about this um you, you know or, or is this something that actually yes this is actually was expected and this is actually part of the process that we're going through uh, claire just a quick word from me I think so I've talked before about some of the issues that affect my ability to recruit and retain staff but as well as that just internally what we at Exco are starting to look at so looking at career paths looking at things like placements and apprenticeships mm -hmm. and you hear me talk about now next and later but that now next and later applies to all of those things mm -hmm. that we're doing to retain staff as yeah. well not just recruit them so there is quite a lot of work going on in the background, I think. Okay. Okay, I, th I think there's probably more to come. I don't, I don't know if we, we could pr productively dig into that any further at this moment, but I, th I, I, I think actually it's, it's just a helpful to the way the discussion is evolving. It almost helps to identify the type of thing, yeah, type of information that we need to be able to have a, a robust discussion. Um, just moving on to patients, public and partners. Uh, any specific questions around that? Michael. Yeah, I've just got um, two questions and a comment. Um, we were talking about this earlier, but um, the reputational index, we've been promised that for a number of years now, and I, I wondered why it's taking so long. And my second Maybe we should just uh, ask yeah, Rachel, yeah. who's <laughs> sat next to you, we have uh, been talking maybe about to answer that one, and one at a time, eh? Yeah, thank you. So on the reputation index, we went out to procure a, uh, an external supplier for that. And unfortunately, despite um, initial interest, we weren't successful in uh, receiving bids that we could then uh, let the contract. So we're in the process of re-procuring that uh, specific piece of work um, as part of a larger contract that is around helping to provide us with insight um, for uh, customer uh, customer groups um, so it will be part of a wider contract and we're we're actively progressing that at the moment but through the procurement process okay. 
And your second question, Michael? Yeah, it, it's just an observation, and it reflects my previous executive career. Um, do we ever canvas what members of parliament think of the MHRA and awareness of the MHRA? Because I think at the moment we're probably in a good position, but where we might be in three or four years' time. Uh, and I also think members of parliament are an interesting proxy because they have to deal with their constituencies. You know, do they know that the MHRA exists to... You know, the contact points. Uh, it's just a very open question, Chair. OK. Yeah. Rachel, can I maybe come to you on that one as well? What do we do with MPs? Yeah, we haven't done that specific uh, piece of work so far, but very happy to take that away and look at it, and uh, obviously in discussion with DHSC colleagues as well. Mm. OK, and June? It would be a good time to do that. There was a lot of work in the context of the Medicines and Medical Devices Bill that enabled over the period of that negotiation to do a lot of education, really. And uh, occasionally when there's an all-party parliamentary group, you can mm. disseminate through that focus. But I think now, particularly as we've got quite a number of aspects that will need to go through Parliament, clinical trials, medical devices, we might wish to, together with sponsor and other colleagues, to think of how that might best be done. May I just clarify this? I, I appreciate MPs are canvassed on a whole range of things, so it can be quite difficult, but it, it's just something worth thinking about as well. Yeah, I, th I, th I think it's a helpful suggestion, actually, Michael, particularly bearing in mind we've got so much you know, going to go through Parliament through statutory instruments, uh, you know, the new you know, device regulations, clinical trials regulations. You know, it's, partly, it's, it's partly engagement, but it's also partly education. You know, I, I know from my NHS role, uh, there's, been, there's, there's been a lot of a lot of work actually done with MPs, and actually they're a remarkably interested constituency in my experience. And those that are interested will definitely take part, and those that aren't won't. Um, so we've got the public inquiries: yep. uh, infected blood, coronavirus, coronavirus Scotland. Although we won't be intimately involved in that, <clears throat> and obviously the Cumberledge. In, um, Health and Social Care Select Committee will yeah. be rescheduled. So each of those is an opportunity, mm. although clearly the climate for that discussion is geared to the situation yeah, that course. it deals with. Okay, moving on to uh, service performance. So we've got science, research and innovation next. Um, any particular questions on that? Paul. Um, it's a question, I think, probably for Mark on the, uh, the clinical trials aspects, and I know why it's been written that way in terms of what we have, um, what we're primarily responsible for. But from a life sciences perspective, it's getting right through the trials, patients recruited and then uh, closed out. Um, that's what. The, so somebody needs to have that overall um, optic uh, and to be looking for the gaps. Similarly with Cambridge, actually, if we're going to get medicine safely into to patients' hands. So the question is, do, to what extent do we think that is down to us or to somebody else? Where does the balance lie? Mark? It's a very good question because um, there's different perspectives there. We, um, in this particular document, uh, we're reporting the metrics that we absolutely control, but we're also very much engaged in trying to maintain the entire ecosystem so a number of the people within the clinical trials team sit on various committees, collaborate with NIHR to try and bring that end-to-end -to -end together. Uh, it's just kind of what, what of that appears here in the balance scorecard and what, uh, what of that appears elsewhere. But the MHRA is not responsible for the entire end-to-end -end system. We have to uh, kind of do the R bit and the influence the rest. Uh, and so who, who, who does have the optic? over their entire spectrum? Is that somebody, is that? Good question. Graham or um, <laughs> Catherine? <laughs> but. Graham, do you want to have a I, I, I was looking to our DH colleague, actually. Yeah, exactly. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I think somebody needs to. Yeah. And if, if we recognise that there isn't anybody, maybe, um, that we need to be working, that does mm. then perhaps comes to, 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 to pick up in the partnership work. Yeah, maybe, maybe Glenn, actually, from a partnership point of view, how do, how do we actually start to bring some of these things together in terms of influencing uh, other parts of the ecosystem? So the conversations that have, to some extent, already started, certainly with NHS England colleagues, HRA, briefly, so we've on from there, to take that system view. Um, I think people have heard me talk about what we can what we control, what we can influence, what we can shape. Um, we can certainly influence delivery of clinical trials. Mark's right, we're going to control some aspects of it. 
but the system is willing to work together to do it. Um, and many of the delays that you see in the system are out, out with our, our yeah. uh, controller actually sitting in, in NHS, which means we need to talk directly to large academic centres, ICSs, and then go up a scale to national level. Um, and as all, with all partnerships, it all starts with a conversation, and we've had many of them on this topic, and we're moving forward, hopefully, some meetings on this topic in the new year. Okay. So that feels like work in progress, I yep. think, is, 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 is what, I've, what I've heard there. But Catherine, just from uh, the Department of Health's perspective, you know, you've obviously got the oversight. I know not you personally acro across everything, but from a medicines prescribing, that starts with medicines development. Uh, you know, w what else is the department looking for in this area to actually try and ensure that all the different arm's length bodies are working effectively together? Um, well, my colleagues in in the research executive um, are working with all the different system partners and their aim is to deliver a step change in the improvements needed but as Glenn said it's it's a, a multi-piece jigsaw that yeah. needs everyone pulling in the same direction but there is a, a key objective for them. Okay and, and from that perspective is there anything else that the MHRA could do to help or facilitate that? If there is they haven't raised it with me so they must be a, content with what MHRA are Okay, because I, because I think actually the MHR is a willing partner here. You know, it's, mm. it's, it's, it's in our collective interest uh, to support the uh, life sciences vision and actually help to get new products to patients more quickly. And I think, you know, we're a willing partner in that. So if there is anything that you identify through colleagues in the department, Catherine, then please let us know. Of course. June? The Recovery, Resilience and Growth Initiative has got some key chunks of work mm. that we're delivering. And I wonder if that needs revisiting, actually, in the light of Paul's question, yeah. just to be sure that we're optimally involved. Not so, just so, so what would the action be on that, June, just so we can I think it that. would be to go back through, um, I think Dr. Louise Wood has moved on, so there's a, a new person there. It would be a good chance to re refresh that relationship and just make sure that whatever it is that uh, was expected of us is being delivered optimally and uh, that uh, there aren't any other aspects that with our legislative reform we could be doing. So I think there is a, a focal point there to fully exploit, and I'm sure yeah. Dr. Lucy, Professor Lucy Chapel, would be happy to debrief on her vision as well. Okay, so it sounds like there maybe is an action there in terms of following up with uh, with, with Professor Chapel uh, to actually uh, yeah, see is there anything else that the MHRA could do. And I'm sort of looking at you, uh, Glenn, in the sense of uh, Chief Partnerships Officer. Um, you know, it's, it's, I know it's a relationship you've already got there, but I think it, just make sure is anything else the MHRA can do to help. I think that was the essence of Paul's yeah. questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, Graham, did you have a question on science research and innovation? Uh, just very briefly. I mean, it, it feels like it's, moved, it's progressed since our last conversation in South MIMS. I mean, I think the thing you're highlighting for a metric for approval seems to be sensible, and I think focusing on that will be good. There's, there's some of them are still quite numbers counting, um, which I think we've discussed before is probably not what we want to have. And I'd I don't know if there are any specific updates on, on some of those, but I think you know, numbers of papers, for example, is yeah. probably not what we want to be hearing about. Yeah, and, and just, just adding weight to that, actually, on, on the 16th of November in South Mims, Mark, we did say, and the action in the, uh, on page 12 is broaden the measures to include the impact and quality of our scientific work uh, rather than the volumes. So that doesn't feel that that's moved on as much as we might have hoped after 10 months. It hasn't uh, perhaps reached that level, but I, I would highlight that the CEO report contains a lot of impact measures. So what we're trying to do is work out how to get the impact, for some of which are very long term, fitted nicely into the balanced scorecard. So there's actually been a lot of work going on in the background, but yeah. it hasn't quite really made it through into a mature structure yet. Yeah. But, um, no, I, I totally acknowledge that we are we're tasked to get the impact measures here, yeah. and new standard launched, uh, standard launched at speed and so forth are all me um, are all me uh, well are all the impact statements. But how to actually fit it in terms of logical progression that you see the trends over time is and it's that trend analysis that's missing. Yeah. Okay. Content with that, Graham. Yeah, I think the timelines you're working to are much longer, so it's hard to fit into this kind of rhythm. But I think if you can come back with a way of doing it, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Um, just moving on then to the next section, which was healthcare quality and access. Can I just ask if there are any specific questions around that? Um, Catherine. Um, really helpful um, report. Thank you, Laura. And uh, what I was interested in, so you mentioned in the report some of the actions that you're taking to improve performance on 
um, timeliness of um, authorisation decisions. And I was wondering if you just give a bit more detail about the work that's underway to improve performance and when you expect that, to see that take effect. Yes, th thanks, Catherine. So um, this is around the approvals of licences. And one of the things I've tried to bring out, actually, in the HQA is that we do an awful lot more than that. Um, so, but on those on those aspects, yeah, we are looking at. I'm looking at three things really, which is people, process, and technology. Um, and the improvements um, will will come as we fix those three things. So, on people, one of the things I've mentioned in there is we do have some quite critical resource gaps around pharmaceutical assessors and non-clinical assessors. These are really key people, particularly um, uh, well, both both of them. They have opportunities in the industry, so salaries are, are an issue with all of them. We are, um, we've, we've got a lot of new pharmaceutical assessors coming on board now. They need training and, and, and bringing up to productivity and a few gaps. Um, and non-clinical assessors, we have struggled to recruit people on that. So that's one of the priority areas that we're looking at from a perspective of growing our own talent, if you like, yeah. um, and really thinking about how can we, it, it won't, that won't be immediate, we still need to deal with the immediate issues, um, but, but there's the longer term, if this, is, if this is a problem recruitment area, how do we make sure that we grow non-clinical assessors ourselves internally? So in terms of people, it is about re, uh, re, re, recruiting. In terms of, um, uh, of performance, uh, of, of process, we are looking at a number, of, a number of different things, and some of these things have started already. So um, consistency is a big thing for industry. Actually, what they want, if you're putting an application in for a drug, you need to be able to tell your board when they're going to be able to plan the launch of that drug. It's as simple as that. So actually not knowing is very difficult for industry, and we are in continuing dialogue, um, particularly we're on generic medicines with the BGMA, and they're also starting to look at bio similars about that consistency of performance and in their last review we're still not getting things out as quickly as they would like but we are starting to reduce the variability of responses and do things like give um, more more certain responses to when things will be able to come back to them um, one of the things that we our next workshop that we're planning with them is to look at how we define our high quality assessment because we make commitments which are beyond our statutory commitments to turn things around in, in a certain amount of time, 150 days, and that is for high quality assessment. So what does a high quality assessment look like? Yeah. Because what we, what we find is that, that people, are, you know, we're spending a lot of time supporting lower quality assessments and that actually has a knock-on effect on the high quality ones. I want to be able to separate those two things. And then the last thing on technology, um, that is, is, is really around RMS and as I said earlier we have started the discussions for the discovery of RMS um, and I think that will, that will start to have an effect when the MVP is in place and we can start to see that bedding down and, and as Claire has emphasised this is getting MVP in place and then continuing to improve as we use that. Really important they will understand that. So this isn't a switch that I can switch on, um, but it is something that uh, we are continuing to work on. And I think people and getting people in post and making sure those people um, are, are in a position where they can delay, uh, de deliver. Um, this week, actually, I, I have got all of the assessors together for a learning day on Thursday, um, which is where we will bring some of these conversations together. We've actually got the BGMA coming to that as well. So it's ongoing work in progress. Yeah. See, I think this is where the granularity of data is really helpful, uh, Laura, and I know, I know you're really leading on that, because, because I think actually there's some things that are in our control uh, and there's a lot of things that are not in our control. And I think we need to separate those two out because I think low quality submissions, you know, you do take more time. And actually, we, you know, there will be requests for information and it will take longer to get an approval. And actually that is part of the narrative, whereas a high quality submission should be able to go through more quickly. And I think we need to be able to explain that uh, in, in, a, in a rational way. And so, I, you know, again, I applaud Laura's um, diligence at actually really driving in to understand what the, some of the root causes are because they're not all in our control. Some of them are, mm -hmm. and the staffing ones clearly are. Uh, but, you know, and again, I, I, I like the long-term approach, but we've also got to get a short-term solution too. Yeah. So, okay. Graham, did you want to follow up on that? Just a brief comment. In, in terms of some of the data presented, I found quite helpful to address some of the narrative I hear externally. So one of the narratives I hear a lot is, MHRA is very good at COVID at the moment. It's not focusing on other things. 
And I think the data there suggests very much that you've broadened, you've broadened your approvals mm. quite a lot to, to non-COVID work, which I think is helpful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's a good example of where that's yeah. going to be useful. And, and on that one, I'd really like to do that with the established medicines as well, because yeah. that's the patient impact. That's it the is. conversation you can have about the, the sorts of drugs that are coming through. That's more challenging, because for the new active substances, because we only had 14, we could look through them manually. Um, so finding a way of drawing that out with the volume of, of approvals that you get on the established medicines is going to be more challenging, but yeah. that's where we're going with that, because yeah. that's a, a much more patient-focused yeah. um, uh, story. Yeah. But I think, I think the rigour that you're, you're driving there, Laura, I think will serve as well. And I think then the transparency to be able to explain the differences, um, you know, will we'll demonstrate, you know, that we're doing our part and we also need our partners to do theirs. Okay, just, uh, we, I'm conscious of time, but we're also going to talk about safety in a lot of detail shortly. But are there any specific questions on the safety section? Uh, one question. I think the granularity of the data is excellent. And it, if I've got the right place for... Under Measure 6, Compliance Assurance Activity, site inspections, 112 supply chain sites were inspected and 13 referrals for critical findings. That's above 10%, it's around about 12%. There's no systemic issue emerging there that we need to be concerned about? That's yeah, still we, Laura. Yeah, we had a lot of conversations about what to actually put on here Jeff because the referral of the critical findings doesn't necessarily mean okay. they're the problem. That's the, that's the earliest sign okay. that they've gone in and they've found something that they are worried about in critical. Yeah. Once, it's, once it's gone and been looked at, it may not actually be critical, okay. but that, the, the, the process of sending it, uh, of referring it, is to bring out exactly that thing. Okay. Because you've got one body yeah. then looking across and saying, you know, are these connected? Is there a systemic okay. issue? So, um, yeah, that's, that's uh, probably the way we've chosen to, okay. to set that's it out. Thank you. Um, but uh, yeah, I will talk to the guys about that and see if we can bring something about that out in the narrative mm. about how we do that. Okay, it's very helpful. Because yeah, that's thank what you. the referrals are there for. Yeah, because <laughs> again, it's back to how do we interpret this data, I think, isn't it? So, yeah. Which I think is, is, is probably helpful. So just on safety and surveillance, as I said, we're going to talk about the Cumberledge paper shortly, but uh, is there any specific questions on that section? I'll move straight on, Alison, just to, uh, to, to save you. That we'll hear you from you again shortly. Uh, and then that leads us on to uh, digital uh, and technology. Um, any final questions around that? Yeah. Uh, don't forget your uh, button, please. Thank you. Is this going to be expanded out at all, Claire? I thought it might be. So what, what's the next stage then? Uh, great minds, and I think you're just doing the, you're on mute, just that we normally do on Teams, so um, someone yeah. to, <laughs> just saying. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think, um, so th there are some things um, that I report on that are covered elsewhere, so recruitment and diversity and so on, I mean, but this report, I think it, it's quite a new entry onto the balance scorecard, and it's quite skinny and really quite dry as well, so it definitely needs more narrative. What is a P1 and a P2 and why did they increase in April and so on? So I know what was happening in the background with people coming back into the building, network issues and addressing legacy and so on. So, yeah, it will be a, a richer um, narrative in future. But th there is lots of work going on in the background. So efficiency is getting better at keeping the lights on, but also what I call the delight factor. So really raising the bar on our standard of service as well. Um, and I've had a small restructure within the team to place a focus on that. And just the last thing on cyber, that keeps me awake at night. Um, so ask me what I was thinking about at five past four this morning. That was it. But we are constantly working with partners and industry to get better at that. So 59% 50, is better than some of our some other organizations in the same category as us but it's still not a hundred percent of it so yeah. there's lots of work and resource going on in the background to um, improve that that's great claire i was, I was also thinking about things like usability we've, we've got a All lot of, of new that. systems going in and yeah. you know, um, uh, ease of use things like exactly. that exactly um, and then all the critical dependencies as you mentioned we've got in other projects it's great to see some indicator of how we're keeping up our support of yeah, all, all absolutely. of absolutely. It, it's a classic, it's a classic balance of usability and security, but we yeah. can do it better. Um, and we could have an offline if you're really interested, because I am quite passionate about this, but I'm mm. 
boring with it as well, I think. Yeah. Um, no, but it's important, it's important, Claire, and, and I, do, I do think actually on data security that is a, that's a fundamental measure. It is, Completely course. fundamental, and, and actually it's clearly better than it was, and there's more work to be gone, you know, to be done, which is great. I think, I think from my perspective, I think the usability piece feel, feels important. It is. But actually, I think the delivery of our major programs, and I'm thinking particularly, you know, Safety Connect's coming to the end, but actually regulatory management system, you know, some, some sort of um, measure that shows how we're progressing on something that's so fundamental to the agency, and, and that, that felt that was missing to my, to my mind. Yeah, I think... Um, and what we don't want is the Gantt chart. We don't need to come up with a solution no, now, no, but, no, um, but, but we need, we, I think the board needs assurance that the most fundamental investments that we're making are actually being progressed and are on track or are being dealt with in a, yeah. in a confident way. I'll, I'll be talking about that um, at a board soon, I mm. believe. Um, but yes, we've not separated RMS, for example, out today, but it's kind of covered, it's into, it, it's weaved mm. amongst all of the things that yeah. we've talked about in some shape or form mm. today, even in the finance section yeah. as well, improvements okay. there. So. Great. So I think that's, we, we spent a, a lot of time on that report, but I think this is always was seen as a work in progress. Uh, you know, we, we're trying to, uh, you know, develop our measures, and I think we'll continue to do that. So, uh, you know, thank you to everyone who's participated in, in that. I think the questions that have been asked today may be, be quite, hopefully quite insightful for the executives in terms of, if that question was asked, it's because the narrative didn't cover it that will be almost the way to think about this. And so therefore, how can we make sure the narrative picks up some of those questions of understanding, uh, but also more importantly, context, I think, uh, is, the, is, is the way I would describe that. But uh, uh, again, thank you for the, the time. I think we can note the report uh, as work in progress. Uh, I don't think we can gain full assurance from all of this yet, but I think we're definitely moving in the right direction and that feels very positive. So thank you for that. In terms of uh, the next report we've got is then uh, a, a very important one. It's uh, just over two years since the, uh, the Cumberland's review. Um, and so we've, we've looked at this uh, in every sort of six months or so since, since the Cumberland's review. And uh, so Alison, we've got a report here, which again, you can assume has been read. Uh, but uh, yeah, again, the question is how many of the key deliverables have been implemented since the Cumberland's review uh, was published two years ago and what difference have they made to patients? So any introductory comments and then we'll go yes, to questions. Yes, if I might, because I think I'd like to pull that out just a little bit more in, in just a quick sort of introduction. So I think for those online, um, obviously everyone in this room is aware of the independent medicines and medical devices safety review and what it challenged the MHRA to do, which was to substantially revise its surveillance systems to and to ensure it engages more with patients and the outcomes that they care about. And the ambition is very much to ensure patients have an integral, integral role in its work. So I do believe the agency has taken this challenge to heart. And that, and in fact, the transformation of the agency's structure is built very much on the ambition of putting the patient at the heart of everything that we do. And this paper sets out a number of key deliverables that we've achieved over the last two years and a couple that are still in progress. But if we think about what will patients actually see, I hope patients, for example, be reassured by our new code of practice, and that's about managing conflicts of interest for our independent experts who provide us advice, and that ensures our experts remain independent and impartial. And through this policy and through the development of this policy, we sought patient engagement um, and uh, consultation process, and we will continue to seek that engagement as often and as meaningful as possible. Um, the patient involvement strategy, published in September of last year, also specifically sought and incorporated patient input. And I hope patients can see their views reflected in this strategy. And then in time, we'll begin to see more meaningfully the impact of the ambition that's set out in that strategy. I hope patients who have accessed our yellow cards will already be seeing the benefit of the improved yellow card system and that enables for example reporters to update their own reports and as I mentioned earlier the agency to request additional information from reporters and I think that some improvements of such as this will really help us improve our dialogue with patients and there's for example a news feed so users can now keep more up to date with the latest research analysis that's coming from our yellow card system. 
There's things that won't be so obvious to patients, but I think is really important to highlight, and that's around our evidence generating capabilities. And a good example there is the clinical practice research database pregnancy register. And that's very important for us. Mm. We've got a specific sort of review on teratogen, teratogenic medicines ongoing. We want to identify pregnancies recorded in CPRD because that enables us to look at rare exposures and the outcomes. And that's really important for patients and their families. And just to highlight, there's a lot of work going on across our whole agency. Laura's leading on the medical future medical device regimen and Mark on the future clinical trial regimen. And I think that's all, all of those have had significant patient and public engagement and consultation through that. And uh, we'll obviously continue to commit to work with patients and we're very much looking forward to working with the new patient commissioner to further strengthen our process. Very happy to stop there and take any questions. Well, thank you, Alison. I think it's a very comprehensive but also a very easy to read report, so thank you for that. Um, uh, Paul, do you want to kick us off? Um, no, thank you. Um, so I'm interested in paragraph 28, which I thought I got really quite excited about, this um, UK-wide medicines information system could be solving all of this sort of joining the dots problem that we have. And then just checking on the tense of certain words, it wasn't clear to me whether this is actually happening in development or just an aspiration. Um, and so I wonder whether you can just clarify what is actually happening, um, how transformational you think it could be, and what additional things you think may be missing. Mm -hmm. So the um, so this was part of the um, uh, the ambition to better use registries, and I think more specifically, really looking at medical device registries, because we know that this area is an area we which is more data poor to be honest, and especially in linking, which is very important for me in safety, linking someone receiving a device, especially an implantable device, with their long-term outcomes from that device and really tracking the patient journey. And the ambition is now to use registries, linking with the UDI number, which is a unique device identifier number, which is starting to come into the device world. Um, through registries and I know there's an ambition to significantly improve and enhance those registries and we're working with NHS Digital on that and it, um, in order to ensure MHRA needs are recognised and incorporated into some of the outcome measures which are coming through the registry. So I don't think it's immediate but it's def the, the good thing is actually in this area we have real linkages across the different bodies and parts of the NHS and parts of the healthcare ecosystem which need to use that data. So I'm hopeful for the future, but it's, it's going to take a little bit of time to come through. Yeah, Paul? And, and will that pick up um, private practice as well? I think that's something that we're not confident of at the moment. So we need to explore how we better capture not only device use in the private sector, but also device prescribing, uh, sorry, uh, medicines prescribing. Yeah. Okay, Paul, yeah, okay. I, th I think the, just a follow-up to that, um, obviously with NHS Digital being merged into NHS England at the moment, is that likely to delay some of these ambitions? I'm not sure as exactly mm. on, what, on what the sort of the work programmes are in the new um, organisation, so I would maybe Catherine can help us on that. Yeah, so a a any perspective around the, around, around the merger with NHS Digital and NHS England and its impact on patient safety issues? Uh, can you use the red button? Well, no, at the moment they're doing a big overhaul of their governance to reflect the merger and um, but beyond, I'm not aware yeah. of the status of the individual programme, yeah. I'm afraid. I, I, th I think it's a relevant point in the sense that uh, NHS England is looking to lose about 40% of its staff. And so therefore I can imagine that some programmes of work will not be progressed at the speed we would ideally like. And I think therefore how do we influence that to ensure that patient safety comes first and actually what more can we do to uh, you know to, to make that on keep that on the agenda okay uh, Graham um, first of all I mean I think there's a huge amount in here that's mm -hmm. been done which is great and, and um, you know I think what the one I'm looking at the moment is, is important in terms of reclassifying mesh as a class 3 device for example my question I don't want to go back to the previous session but just what I don't get a confident feel for is whether we pick up the next mesh and how and how the board's going to see that so in terms of the metrics 
I didn't see anything in there that helped me with that. And have you had any thought about how that might feed through, whether it's through the CPRD and a degree, <coughs> degree of granularity, or whether it's the class of device that's having yellow card reports? Um, has there been any conversation about what that might look like? Classic surveillance. So I think it's a mixture of everything. It's not one metric that's going to deliver. So certainly the new legislation will upgrade implantables onto a class three device, and Laura could pick up more of that detail, but it will enable us to have stronger pre-market requirements for those products, as well as stronger post-market requirements around safety and surveillance. So that's a really important feature. The next important feature is what we've talked about today is the unique device identifier. That will enable us to better understand what product or what device a patient has implanted. And obviously the ambition there is to enable that particular number to be an electronic health record. That will then enable us to track the patient journey from receiving that advice. In the meantime, these registries that we talked about, we've got the pelvic floor registry and other registries, national joint registries, are really excellent example of how we can track um, from a device being received from an, a surgical procedure and understand the outcomes of that. And it's, I think in devices is even more complicated, if you like, than medicines, because it's not just the device. You need to understand the whole <coughs> surgical procedure. Who did the intervention? What was yeah. the patient's risk factors around that intervention? What were their pre-existing conditions? It's not just the device. You need to understand all of those factors around it. Um, which is really, really important. And then, of course, with Safety Connect, we're massively improving our device capabilities around vigilance, better capture, better analytical capabilities, um, which also will help us to better interrogate signals as yeah. they come through. So I think it's, a, it's the whole picture which will enable us to better capture that, as well as this patient engagement and really listening to patients and understanding what their views yeah. are and okay. acting on them as promptly as possible. Yeah. Graham, does that answer? Uh, half. I mean, I, I think I have tremendous confidence that there's a lot going on, and I think these initiatives are fantastic. And I think what, what I'm not sure yet is how we capture that in terms of being confident that we're going to pick up the next thing. And when I, when I, look, at the, when I look at the signals coming through, I think some, some, some choices in the granularity of that data would be helpful. And I don't know what they are, and we probably can't discuss them now, but it might be the number of yellow cards for class three devices or something like that that have been picked up. So I discussed that with the team actually in terms of our, which we didn't touch in in the previous paper, in terms of how we could better differentiate the device reports that are coming through. And we can't do that very easily at the moment. As soon as Safety Connect comes in, we'll be able to provide a more granular picture of what the device's report, um, reports are, which might help to start to give you some of that reassurance. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Raj. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Um, it's very exciting to hear about the registry and the, U and the U UDI in terms of it, because I think that's, those are going to be key enablers there uh, to, to, for you to be able to get a better understanding. Very much in the context of the granularity, granularity and also how, how are we going to provide context on this, uh, Alison? Is there any thoughts on devices is such a long, big scope. So any thoughts in terms of when you kick this off, with Safety Connect as well as the registry, all of that coming together. Would you be able to test something? What, any thoughts you can share on how you're planning to implement this? Because it's so complex and the scope is so wide. Uh, I'm almost thinking, do we take a structured approach at the beginning on something on a smaller concept, test it to see if it works, and then scale it? Because um, as you know, the device world is <laughs> never ending. Yeah. And to be clear, we're not entirely, we're not driving and leading on the registry work. We're collaborating with um, NHS of Digital on that work. But I think, yes, in fact, we're starting to get access to some of that data and a really good registry, an exemplar registry is the National Joint Registry. And I have our epidemiological team looking at that to see, could we test a signal through that? Could we understand if we took a previous signal, could we have identified it? What other measures might we need to better enhance our, our signal capability and our signal assessment? So I think, yes, we're looking for case studies all the time and new signals all the time as they 
to, to try and identify how we can use registries which are pre-existing if they haven't identified the signal and we've got that through the manufacturer or through some other route. Could we have, if we now look retrospectively and start to look at those data sources and if we had looked at it in a different way, would we have seen that signal earlier? So I think we, it's, it's at the moment we're still at an exploratory, exploratory stage, it's a discovery stage, how can we best use this data to complement the signal detection that comes through the yellow card? And that's an area we also need to improve with device. You, you can see from the previous paper we have less recording on devices, less yellow cards on devices than we do on medicines. So how can we enhance that? Because that would be a really good source of data as well. Okay. Okay, Raj. Thank you. It's work in progress. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think there's, there's there's a lot to be said about all of that, and um, I think I think it, it links back to Graham's point actually in terms of trying to think about some some test cases might be a good thing to do to actually help to can we identify the last mesh. And I don't know whether we've got enough historical data to almost run yeah, mesh through the uh, you know through, through through the process to sort of see what what signals we would have been able to pick up. But maybe it's too late to do that based on the date, type of data that we had. But you know. I think it's worth thinking about. Were you related point, Laura? Yes, it was. I was just going to add two points about the devices legislation, which isn't in place yet. But, it may, but also, the, in the devices legislation with the, with the implantable devices, as well as reporting when something is going, going wrong, there will be a new requirement to proactive reporting of how the device is performing in mm. any way. So I think okay. that gives us a position where we're not waiting yeah. for something to go wrong, which, which is problematic. Um, and, and I think the... the um, the second point I was going to make has now gone out of my head, I'm afraid. Um, that's okay. You can come back later if, you, <laughs> if that's easier. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, that's fine. So two, two more questions. We've got Janaid and then we've got Mercy. Alison, thank you. I, I really applaud all the work that's happened here, and I think in, in response to the Cumberledge Review, one of my reflections of the Cumberledge Review is there's only so much that we can do in isolation as the MHRA. It's so critical if we are to put patients first. It has to be a joined-up approach across the, the wider health and social care ecosystem uh, and, and especially NHS England within that. And if, if I think about the medical directors who have responsibility for patient safety, the appointment of the patient safety commissioner back in July, I wonder if we were to ask those partner organisations what is their response to the Cumberledge Review and have something so detailed as we have here, whether we could actually put, make a real path forward to make impact and improving lives for patients and public. As a GP, when I see patients, they get, I, I don't think they understand necessarily the role of NHS England versus MHRA versus everybody else and all these people that have responsibilities around safety. Actually, do collectively do we have a responsibility around safety? And how do we collectively do mm. our best work? And I think it's something that Paul's raised before and I've raised, but it has to be an ecosystem approach. Yeah. And I just wonder who's having that conversation so that we're not operating just in isolation and controlling what we can but actually nudging the rest of the ecosystem to drive patient safety moving forward too. Okay. Um, so my, my question was about pa the patient safety commissioner um, and actually uh, engaging with her um, on that cross um, NHS cooperation. So exactly on that, mm. because there's only certain things that we can do and it is working with the rest of the NHS. And I think she's got a key role. So how do we facilitate that? So you're going to have a kind of a obviously an ongoing dialogue, but I wonder if even at PSEC we should be talking strategically with her about what we could do and our influence on the rest of the system and also how we fit in, so how we can support it. Um, and of course, uh, a number of us also sit on ICB boards yeah. too and very, very interested in, in, in getting that kind of feedback um, yeah. as well. Well, a, well a, fu a fundamental part of the Cumberland Review is about joining up the health system, let's be, let's, let's be honest. And so I think the Patient Safety Commissioner seems like a really valuable point. Uh, you remember now, uh, and I'll come back to Alice in a second. It was almost like it was planned because oh. it, it flows on very well from those two points. It is about the fact that in the legislation we also have um, requirements around the information to be given to patients at the point of the implantation or yeah. before. And I think how we make that work 
has to be a system conversation mm -hmm. because it gives no use just putting that in the, the, and then working out how that's got to happen. So I think that does connect in. Yeah, it, it does. So. Alison, any, any final thoughts just yes, to how we bring this together with the Patient be, Safety Commission? Yeah, there will be a government response to Cumberledge, and this our work forms part of the wider government response to Cumberledge, so it's important to emphasise that. And we've reached out yeah. to Henrietta Hughes, the new patient commissioner, and we will be having conversations with her, of course, as she starts to establish herself in post. She's relatively recently appointed, but an incredibly important link for us at the MHRA to in order to, in order to get that ecosystem response and I also would also point out that we engage with the devolved nations bodies as well around our safety issues yeah so, so, so I, I, I'm just conscious of time but I think I think actually that does make a lot of sense and so there is still a government response still to to formally come out um, it was obviously paused because of uh, you know the uh, you know the Queen's death unfortunately but I'm sure that will come out in due course I think also with a new ministerial team it's probably important that we also take every opportunity that we've got you know because uh, the new uh, Secretary of State is talking about ABCD, so accident and emergency, backlogs, <coughs> care, doctors and dentists. So somehow we need to think either of an E or put an S on the end. Um, because I think there's something around safety, uh, you know, and, and previous Secretaries of State have actually focused on that very heavily. Uh, we just need to make sure that isn't lost in, in, in the political process, I think is fair to say. Um, so I'm seeing nods around the table on that. Okay. I think on that, on that basis, thank you very much for the report, Alison. Uh, we're asked to again note it for assurance, and I think we can be assured that there's a, an awful lot of work that has been done and is still going on. And I think, uh, I think we now start to think about how can we influence the overall system uh, as, as well as what we can do internally ourselves. So thank you very much for that. Just moving on then, that takes us on to the next report, which is also on patient safety and engagement. And we have a patient safety and engagement committee. Mercy, you're the chair of that committee, had a couple of meetings recently. Uh, you can assume we've read the paper, but any key points you want to draw to our attention on page number 54? Yeah, just, just the main things about this is now our eighth uh, meeting as PSEC. So, um, so really kind of uh, by the end of the year, we'll be reviewing uh, what we do and how we do it. Um, but at regularly at our meetings, we do talk about our work program. And because it links to Cumberledge as well, um, about doing more deeper dives into parts of um, those kind of issues. So um, yeah, we're, we're kind of shaping up for the next year really what we're going to be looking at um, as well. Um, but the, some of the key things that came to, to us, and I am seeing a change, um, which was, is really nice to report, that from February 2021 till now, I really do see much more patient engagement work going on. So it's, it's good to reflect on that. So the, the two kind of key subjects we, we saw, CPRD um, came back to us and we particularly looked at um, really how people know about their data being kind of used by CPRD. Now, we're very supportive of CPRD. This is kind of people's GP data um, and uh, gives us huge amounts of insight, really, um, on, you know, kind of, uh, well, not just uh, patient safety um, issues, but a, a whole range of, of research issues that, that can be used. Um, but we uh, wanted to particularly interrogate how people kind of knew about you know, uh, how their data is being used and if they, if they knew about it. We had a number of suggestions um, about how that, could, uh, th how that could be kind of uh, used, um, mainly round about the website, but there might be other ways of, of in engaging people. And of course, the, the other thing that we looked at um, that came to, I think the, the last board was the clinical trials consultation response. Um, so, uh, which was, um, amazingly well done, I have to say, that we were kind of inundated with, with um, uh, responses uh, to the clinical trials um, data. Uh, and we, we got some good insight into what those, um, that consultation was going to do uh, around influencing the legislation. Obviously, legislation is going through, so can't comment in too much detail. Um, but I, I, I obviously turn to my colleagues on, on PSEC. Um, but it was, it was good to see, first of all, the engagement with a wide variety of people uh, around the, uh, 
the clinical trials consultation, but also um, that um, th that debate uh, about what goes into legislation, what goes into guidance, um, I think really was influenced by those consultation responses. And, and uh, though, so it was very kind of heartening, really, uh, to see that when it's done really well, it really makes a huge amount of difference. Uh, obviously, uh, the next step for us is looking at implementation, but that's, <laughs> but that's further down the line. Um, the, the other key thing to say is the first time that um, PSEC and the ODRC, which is Mandy is uh, going to comment on, on next, um, had a joint meeting for the first time on equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, and what we were able to do was look at not just our, our staffing and issues like that, but also uh, about our uh, engagement uh, with the, a, a diversity of people through our public consultations and, and other people that we uh, need to kind of uh, look at. So actually bringing both those data sets together uh, and learning from each other um, was really, really useful, I think. Uh, I think we both agreed we've got a bit of a way to go, but, mm -hmm. um, but that was really useful. So actually uh, bringing together committees, assurance committees, occasionally to look at the same subject, from, but from different perspectives, as we've done with uh, AREC as well, yeah. actually really worked. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, I think that's, that's really very clear. But uh, colleagues, any thoughts or comments or observations? I really like the principle of actually looking through equality and diversity through the different lenses of the internal and the external because there, there is an inevitable linkage um, and I think it's learning. So, I, I, again, I applaud you for that. I think that's, that, that's really, really excellent. Um, you know, and I think this is the benefit of having the assurance committees to look, you know, dig into more detail, uh, as you've done around CPRD and, and on the clinical trial consultation response in particular. Uh, and I know that you work closely with Alison and her team when it comes to some of the patient safety components. So thank you for that. So on that basis, unless there are any questions, not seeing any questions there. So why don't we note that report with thanks? So thank you very much, Mercy. And as you, uh, you know, quite rightly mentioned, uh, you know, the last substantive paper is from the Organisational Development and Remuneration Committee. And again, uh, Mandy, as the chair of that committee, uh, you've uh, issued a report here. Any key points you want to bring out? Uh, th thanks, Stephen. Um, yes, I would, I'll just pick up from Mercy's point on the first instance. I think it's really helped when we're looking at organisation development, thinking about patient diversity and that all our processes um, have that have patients at the centre of them in many in most cases and that thinking about that diversity and the difference of thinking that's needed is really important to get better quality clinical trials to understand the signals we're, we're coming through so it was a really useful I think discussion um, so just going to the last ADRC meeting, we had quite a full agenda. Um, we majored on the, the work of the um, new organisational structure and operating model and the, the progress with developing the key services. So I'll, I'll focus on those two of the main areas. I think it's fair to say the, um, the organisational structure and operating model, um, rather than seeing this as done, we have the structure in place and it's really the beginning um, of working for a, one agency actually delivering um, better quality services so the two were linked together. I think it's worth saying from an organisation model and structure point of view um, we've been supported by EY for the past couple of years and they have now um, handed over to an in-house team and I think that's to be welcomed because the chief officers I think are now feeling more engaged with the process rather than having transformation as something running in parallel. We had to, had to have some of that work but now I think in terms of getting that structure to actually operate it's very much um, the responsibility of the, of the line leaders. I think we identified that there's, there are several risks to accelerating transformation. One is we've, we've spoken several times about of getting recruitment and key positions filled. That is still uh, a major issue and it's affecting, as, as uh, John said, about our performance um, and also really understanding 
how we can be com pay competitive salaries um, for pretty senior positions. And I think that's something we probably will need to come back to. Um, I think we're seeing good progress with one agency culture, particularly with the, um, the one agency uh, leadership team, which is sort of looking and working cross agency. So I think that's good. Um, and I think another key part is our replacement of our legacy, legacy systems in that our organised structure organisational structure is both people but it's actually also the tools that they have to operate so uh, we've talked about RMS that needs to be um, closely monitored and it's really good to see the leadership of that from with both Claire and with with Laura taking that lead of sort of integrating that together so that's really leading by example we then talked about the service redesign and I think June's mentioned several times about the services are the way we do it's the, our, the way we deliver and how we um, to our patients and to our stakeholders and I think this has been quite a difficult concept for the agency to understand that delivering services rather than maybe delivering approvals or licenses and uh, the two are linked together um, it was encouraging um, at, at the ODRC to have the chief officers um, again taking ownership of the services within their area and how they're developing them and really getting below the skin of what the service is. It's all very nice in theory, um, but I think what we're seeing now is really digging down to, you know, as Laura has said before, um, how you deliver a licence, how many there are, what could be um, what is value adding activity what isn't and that's also going to be a really important part for design of new systems so I was encouraged that those those things are beginning to sort of get traction and we're 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 able to to talk about that and make improvements I th think there's um, there's still a lot of work to do with with the services but I think we're seeing the the ownership now getting into the the line and of people actually operating and how they do things more work to do there um, but I think I was encouraged to see that that's not being this is a theoretical thing this is actually um, being taken ownership from the um, from the chief officers throughout their organizations so it might be something we think about is the um, ODRC, the chief officers play perhaps a bigger role um, in that committee than maybe they have traditionally, um, particularly if services is going to be one of the, mm. the key parts that we're monitoring um, to give assurance back to the board. Um, talk a little bit about technology. And I'll just briefly talk about there's a competency development framework, culture and leadership work. There's, we need to look at this in a little bit more detail. Um, the, the tools are there. Um, I think we're, we now need to see how that's rolling out and actually delivering. And we didn't get a chance to look at that. And the people strategy is again in development and the ODRC will review that document. It wasn't available at the meeting. But again, these are, are key parts mm. for uh, establishing the performance of the agency okay well thank you very much for that so uh, colleague can I just ask uh, again I think that explanation has been quite helpful gives additional context there Amandi so thank you for that uh, any further thoughts comments or contributions June could I maybe just come to, come to you because obviously I think um, you, you you're also been attending some of the uh, ODRC meetings just from your perspective anything else that you want to add that Mandy's not covered I'd like to thank Mandy for the focus you've given to this because it is a very important point of inflection in our journey. And I think, as you say so rightly, now that the ownership of services is embedding, that's a super step forward. It's a really good step forward, but there's need for leadership there. And so that we get a consistent approach across our one agency and that we get optimised mm. delivery, knowing that I guess colleagues who are more familiar with delivering change 
always a tendency to go back to the way you've always done things. So if we have this opportunity now to think differently, we should really grab it and grow where we need to, perhaps reduce where we don't need. And it's going to need quite a bit of rigour, so keep the foot on the accelerator. Mm. Okay. So, so, so I heard a very clear message from Mandy around uh, the importance of services, you know, and I think you, I think you were making a request for more chief officer involvement. So h how do you see that happening, Mandy, in terms of uh, you're presumably going to programme so many services at a particular point in time, or what, 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 what's your ask of the chief officers? I think we, we need to... I probably can't answer that here because um, at the last meeting it was a little bit mm, not sure where this is going. I spoke to June and the, the chief officers who were available came along and I think it made a huge difference. So I think that was learning from that last meeting. Um, I think we need to take offline, review how we're going to yep. take those services through because it's got to be worked through with the priorities of the delivery and the chief officers have, I think have got the key role in um, helping to prioritise that. Yeah, okay. So, so I think actually on that basis then, I think maybe we take an action, Mandy, for you to you know, confirm the programme of work for, uh, for the Organisational Development and Remuneration Committee and then have contact with the uh, checking the availability uh, you know, with the respective chief officers so that we can find times that work for everybody. Because otherwise it, it, it just becomes a, remains a wish as opposed to uh, an action. So if I can leave you with that action, that would be, that would be great. Just one other re reflection from myself, actually. Um, I I've actually volunteered to be a reverse mentor. And I'm currently, I know some of the board members have as well. And actually, that's been a fascinating process so far. I've had sort of three meetings so far. Uh, and, and this is actually with a, uh, a, a member of staff, you know, deep within the organisation and actually sort of mentoring me. And, and it's, it's my opportunity to learn. And actually, it's really interesting we talk about change. And I've just been starting to explore that. But it's become very clear to me that um, you know, our staff feel really personally responsible for their areas of, of work. And so when we start talking about change at a high level, it doesn't really connect. Because actually, they, but how does that affect my piece of work? And that just, to me, reinforces yet again the importance of management and leadership. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's not just about the chief officers, it's about the, then the next level down and then the next level down of managers. So that actually there's, there's really individual conversations to understand the impact these changes might have on people's individual work. You know, and, and then actually, how could that be made better? So I, I'm still in the exploration phase at the moment, but I just thought it was just worth mentioning that, you know, Talking to our staff you know, in the organisation, you know, and, and, and not just around the board table, to really understand the motivations and why, in some cases, we might perceive it as resistance, when actually it's more, from for some of our staff's perspective, more about understanding what are you trying to achieve and then how does that affect the responsibility that I've got on this particular item. So there's, some, there's something there around how we implement change with our staff, not to our staff. And, and I think that's classic leadership, I know. Easy to say, more difficult to do, especially when we've got key vacancies. But, yeah, that was a... a it, so far, it's been really, really insightful. Uh, and, and so those of you that haven't started any reverse mentoring, I still encourage you to do so because it's, it's, it's really informative for me. And so uh, I, I feel I'm benefiting from it. So I'm sure other, other colleagues would too. OK, so that brings us to the end of the, the board papers. Um, June, is there anything that uh, we've not covered so far that you would have liked to have covered? No, I think it's been a very good discussion, very timely. OK, so that leads us on to the final item on the agenda, which is uh, question and answers from members of the public. Uh, as I said earlier, that we, we're very happy to take questions uh, you know, live today in terms of any questions that are relevant to the agenda that are being raised. Um, any questions that uh, members of the public have that are not related to the agenda, we'll very happily answer them in writing. Um, but Rachel, you've been monitoring the chat function, I believe, during the, the meeting so far. Do we have any questions? Yeah, thanks. Um, we've got five questions this afternoon that have come through on the chat function and that relate to items on the agenda. And I understand there's also an additional question that's coming through that's going to be asked live on okay. camera. So shall I start off with the Please first do. one, which relates to the paper on operational performance that um, John presented. And the questioner is picking up the points about debt. And 
is asking uh, what percentage of the debt highlighted in the paper is covered by debts that aren't yet due or that are invoiced in advance. Um, and uh, it's, they make a comment that says that the, it's important that the board needs to be sure of its accounting policies and the treatment of debt. Yeah. I think we started to pick that one up, John, but actually do you want to uh, give, give any colour that you can? In terms of the percentage, uh, I would need to come back and I can get that assessed. I mean, uh, an example, just for information of the sort of fee, is actually, if you look at page, uh, and I didn't have this pre-prepared, but if you look at page um, 139 of the report and accounts, um, it does detail the accounting policies around, not around debt, but around recognition of income. Um, and actually one of the issue, one of the items noted there are service fees invoiced annually in advance at the beginning of the financial year. So of course at the end of Q1, any service fees invoiced in advance will still be, may still be due, depending on the individual service agreement with those service fees as to when payment is due. But typically, uh, commercially, most organisations aren't going to pay it until, uh, or yeah. phased anyway at least. But the debt would still be showing as due if that makes it, or not due, as owed, whether it is actually yeah. due there and then. From a revenue perspective, the revenue is deferred. So we are not recognising revenue for work not yet delivered, okay. and that's what the policy says. Uh, um, I, I, I would need the board to tell me that they know what the accounting policy is, obviously, because it was in the accounts last year, but I am pretty sure they do. Yeah. Um, I would imagine Michael is nodding his head there. Yeah. Um, but on the specific, what is the percentage, I will come back on that one. Yeah. So I think actually, you know, the board did approve the financial yeah. accounts, which includes our <laughs> accounting procedures. So yeah. I can pro provide assurance that, yeah. uh, you know, we do know uh, the accounting pr procedure and, and actually, you know, they are being implemented as well. We've seen that yes. before. I think um, maybe we take an action quite specifically um, f so that uh, John can answer that question through you, Rachel, directly to the questioner uh, so yeah. that we actually uh, fulfill our obligation there. Yeah. Thank no you. Problem. You have a second question, Rachel. Yes, absolutely. Um, this also relates to the paper on operational performance. Uh, so this relates to the section that highlighted that a number of colleagues, I think 38 people were at risk uh, through the uh, HR processes and six of those had been temporarily redeployed. So uh, the questioner says that at the same time as giving these figures, we also mentioned vacancies and there's a big cost in redundancies and in loss of skills. So are there any comments on whether any of the skills of those individuals might have been transferable into other roles? Well, this has been an ongoing process, I think it's fair to say, but June, do you want to give uh, an initial response to that? It's a really key observation. Um, week by week, and it is weekly, we look again at how people's thoughts and plans on that risk are evolving in the context of the vacancies that we have. And so we can absolutely assure the questioner that this is top of our priority. And as I say, it's looked at you know, continuously. Yeah, I think departure from the organisation is always the last possible resort. Uh, we always look at deployment as a principle first. Uh, you know, we've been making all of the vacancies aware to all of our staff and we would continue to do that as, as well, I think it's fair to say. So, yeah, we want to minimise the number of people leaving the organisation through uh, a forced re redundancy, I think it's fair to say. OK, number three. OK, so the next question um, is uh, relating to... Um, safety and yellow card uh, there's actually a couple of uh, questions that i think relate to yellow card um one asks how can harmed patients and families get the accountable uh, accountability they need as there is no way to be heard and uh filling out a yellow card is not enabling them to be heard okay maybe alison i can come to you on that one yeah so so I would like to reassure the question that every single report is assessed and incorporated into assessment and any safety issue identified will be taken forward quickly and thoroughly uh, with the appropriate regulatory action as necessary and we can be transparent on that. We also like to assure them that you know, we have a team of 40 scientists who have continue to have a set of critical functions and that includes safety, reporting, detection, signal management, for any uh, medical product report that we receive. Um, 
Increasingly, I hope, Safety Connect will give patients a better ability, as I've highlighted today, to engage with the yellow card reporting systems, with news feeds, but also opportunities to update their report. And I think, as we've also highlighted, we're involving patients much more um, going forward in our assessments. There's more opportunities to engage with patients through the patient engagement strategy, but also through our assessment uh, procedures so that we engage with patients earlier to understand their lived experience and then to incorporate that into a report. So really just a reassurance that yellow card is heard and is actioned upon. Okay. Thank you very much, Alison. Rachel? Okay, thank you. I think we're able to ask Ian to um, ask his question on camera now. Ian, good afternoon and welcome, if you can hear us. Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi, I hope, can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving your consent to appear on camera today. We really appreciate it. No, but I was um, surprised and delighted that you wanted me to ask my question. It's a little bit of a Dorothy Dixer, as we call it sometimes, but I think also there's a little bit of... Um, bite to it. So just to give you a bit of background is that I actually work in public engagement, but I guess I'm from community and I've been involved in public involvement myself and especially around public involvement in the um, monkeypox trial that you've just approved. And so thank you for approving that and very much monitoring what's happening there. So my question to the board is, can the board provide an update on patient and community engagement, highlighting both what is working well, any feedback, um, or evaluation, especially, and also whether ideas and proposals for improvement. So I know you've had this question for a while, so I was particularly hoping for a few specifics. Yeah, great. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. Well, thank you, Ian. That's uh, really, really helpful. So actually, why don't we come to June first, uh, and then maybe I'll come to Mercy second uh, to add her perspective too. Well, thank you again, Ian, for coming forward. It's a really important question and one that we're always thinking it's front of mind as to how well we're doing. As someone involved in patient and public involvement, you probably know that we published our strategy uh, just about a year ago exactly. And since then, we've been working hard and we will be publishing a progress update in the near future. But let me give you some specifics. And they're specifics that I hope tell a story of systematically involving patients and the public rather than just as an afterthought. Things like the piloting of patient listening sessions for some key safety issues, such as MESH and Valproate, such as our new approach to online consultations, which is really improving the experience because we've got to make it much easier and, if you like, fulfilling and satisfying to work with us. It's so important that we capture patient insights. And then a patient reference group, for example, specifically created for our innovative licensing and access pathway. So there's some, some specifics there, and I could go on. We've had citizens panels for our yellow card biobank, where we want to tap into potential for solving adverse drug reactions through that uh, ability to tr track back to somebody's genetic predisposition. So there's a wealth of examples, and we'll be summarizing those in our progress report. Um, quite rightly, you've asked, what have we learnt, and have we sought feedback? Again, it's bedding in, but we have sought feedback after the listening exercises and uh, woven that into subsequent listening exercises. In terms of proposals for improvement, I guess you probably know, and I don't know if you're part of it, we've had a patient group consultative forum for some years now, and that really has stood us the test of time, but we need to bring it up to today's world. And we're beginning to understand the reasons that sometimes people find it hard to work with us. Um, people are busy. <laughs> There's all sorts of disincentives to actually being able to contribute to our work. So we're going to refresh and expand the diversity and breadth of our patient group consultative forum. And that really is quite pressing, particularly as you'll know what we've learned during COVID of the times when the lack of that diverse input to our work has actually had real outcomes. One of the specifics we can do as a regulator and regulate better is in our regulatory framework. So just on that point, our clinical trials legislation, which is being looked at to refresh and revise, has had a specific focus on making sure that we get a diverse input 
and, if you like, take the trials to the patient. So I hope with some of these examples tells you how absolutely committed we are to making a difference, but how much we want also to engage with people like yourself. So even outside this discussion, if there are areas you'd like to help us or think you can help us with, we are listening. I'll stop there, Stephen. Okay. Well, 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 that's obviously the view of the Chief Executive, Ian, but uh, Mercy Jessingham's uh, a non-executive director and also chair of our Patient Safety and Engagement Committee. So, Mercy, specifically, uh, you know, what's working well and what could we do better? So, Ian, um, I've been working in patient involvement and community engagement for over 30 years, uh, very much from a voluntary sector perspective. So, of course, I'm very interested in what the agency is doing in this. Um, we have an assurance committee where um, we regularly and systematically look at what the agency is doing and specifically how they're changing. And what I've noticed is that with new programmes, they are embedding patient involvement from the very beginning. Um, and so that's really quite reassuring. Obviously, we've got uh, a lot of work to do. Um, to, to look at all areas, but what we're able to do um, at the Assurance Committee, uh, which is Patient Safety and um, Engagement Committee, which we're probably not able to do at the board, is deep dive and look at specifically uh, different areas of what the organisation does. So we have looked at Yellow Card, we've looked at Yellow Card Biobank, uh, we've looked at the Customer Service Centre, um, we've looked at clinical trials and the updates in that, we've looked at the ILAP programme, um, and we're going through um, those services that are now being redesigned as well to uh, ensure that from the very beginning there's um, uh, patients involved on those steering groups, on those committees, in designing what these new services look like. Um, we've got uh, a way to go, Ian, as you can imagine, because it's, it's trying to embed uh, patients at every single level within the organisation. Um, but I, um, I feel that um, if, you, if you wanted um, to, to look at what we've done, those are a public record of our, um, I, I report to the, the board regularly on what we've looked at and, and uh, to give assurance. And I can say from my non-executive um, colleagues, we're, we're quite challenging as well to the, um, the executives, um, but they are very willing, I think, uh, to open up and, and think about patient engagement in a very different way. Um, interestingly enough, the patient um, engagement strategy, uh, which was approved last year, is coming back to my committee uh, at um, our next meeting in October, where we can see how well it's been implemented in a more systematic way. Um, so, so maybe uh, if you tune in to um, when we report back, um, you'll, you'll see in a more systematic way what we, we've actually done. Um, but I've been on the board um, a couple of years now, um, and I am seeing progress. But I think we've, we've got some way to go. Yeah. Well, th thank you, Mercy. So, Ian, I, I hope that gives you some specific examples. I just wonder if I could be very cheeky and maybe ask you a question uh, in return, which is what else, with your professional background, do you think we could do better? Right. Um, well, firstly, just even the time that you've given to that question, I think is encouraging and should be encouraging to other people who are, are online that you, um, you, you, you're you talking the talk and hopefully walking the walk of, of public engagement, and it's not easy to do. Um, I think the things that um, we can, that I would like to see more of, and I think the potential of, is to work in agile ways to think about co-design and co-production. So one of the things that we think about in patient engagement is where's the power sit? Where does the power sit? And that's often the challenge in meaningful public engagement is when you have a single representative on, um, which is the traditional way in which we often we do public engagement, you have someone sitting on a committee. And so what are the more creative ways and what does that mean for changing the practice of the organisation? And I've heard a lot in your meeting today and it's really clear that you're working in quite an efficient and agile way so can that be integrated into the types of way in which you work and so I think about things like human-centered design where we go, do go through that discovery process through the prototyping we don't always necessarily assume that we're going to get it right first time and then we iterate from that and hopefully the 
the solutions that we have at the end of that are more in sync with the needs of community and the way in which community wants to access and would like things to operate. Great. Well, thank mm. you. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, th I think we could. And thank you for your question and for your time. Very much appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ian. We appreciate that. And I think actually we're already doing some of those things already, I think, but more, more to do. So just thank you for your question and uh, you have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. So, Rachel, do we have a written question now? Yeah, so uh, a couple more. Um, the next one is uh, back on, uh, it actually links quite nicely on uh, engaging with patients. So the questioner is saying, have we considered an open door policy to enable victims or patient representatives to highlight safety concerns? And they believe that the FDA in the States has such an initiative. Okay. Uh, Alison, could I uh, maybe come to you with that? Well, I would report, I would um, encourage uh, or point the individual to our yellow card system because really that is the best way to report a safety signal to us. It asks for specific information that can be then integrated into a wider data pool. But it also does, to reassure the individual, provide the opportunity to, to give us a narrative, to give us more information on that particular event that they're reporting. So, and as I mentioned earlier, we then do assess every report that comes to us in the context of other information. And we are also in, um, talking with patients through our assessments. Um, also, of course, we have a customer service center and that um, responds individually to patients if they r write into us. So there is a number of routes already existing where patients can directly contact us. Okay, thank you for that. And so does that leave us one last question, Rachel? Yeah. And the final question actually relates to these meetings. So the questioner was asking, what's the frequency of board meetings in public and uh, where can they find out the dates? Okay, well, maybe I can pick that one up, should I? So, so we're holding these uh, meetings every two months. Uh, so we, we, we're committed to uh, hold six meetings uh, per year uh, in, in public. Uh, they will be on our website. Um, and, and so we obviously have to change the timing uh, today because of the, the Queen's funeral yesterday. Um, but I can certainly tell you just in one second, if I can find the, there we go, I've got it here. Thank you very much. So the next meeting in public will be on 15th of November. Uh, the meeting after that will be on the 17th of January and the meeting after that will be the 21st of March. So they're already in the diary. They'll all be starting at 10 o'clock unless we have any other extraneous events. So uh, that, that, that's, the, that's the principle and uh, we're very committed to continuing this and continue to committing to provide the opportunity uh, for ongoing public engagement. So thank you very much. So does that bring us to the end, um, Rachel? Yes, it does. That concludes the questions uh, that have been raised on items on the agenda. And as you said, any other questions of a more general nature will pick up separately and respond in writing. Great. OK, well, thank you very much. And also thank you to colleagues uh, for, for your contributions today. Uh, I'd also just like to take the opportunity to thank all our staff who've uh, not only been doing the day job, but in many cases have also been helping to either prepare for this meeting uh, or writing, uh, helping to write and contribute to the papers that we've, we've observed today. So uh, thank you to that. Before we leave, I would just like to uh, you know, finally remind everyone that the purpose of the MHRA, as I said right at the very beginning, is to protect and to improve public health. And as you'll probably have seen through our delivery plan and through our performance scorecard, uh, you know, we'll do that through three main avenues. We want to continue to enable scientific innovation. We want to accelerate patient access to new and safe products. And we also want to strengthen our patient safety and our surveillance systems, not only in response to Cumberledge, uh, but also in response to all our new regulatory frameworks that we're establishing along with our technology solutions. So there's a lot of work going on in the agency. Having said all that, I think I'd like to close the meeting today. Thank you for your time and uh, have a good rest of the day. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.